Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellie Nemetz, and this is Gov Sturm, and we are the presidents of the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society. It is our pleasure and privilege to welcome you today to the 11th annual Fold Family Conference in honor of Rabbi Moshe Tendler, sponsored by the Community Synagogue of Muncie. <laughs> Today's conference, Breaking Down the Firewall, bridges the foundations of Judaism with new advances in scientific technologies in medicine. Some of the topics will challenge the way you think. We ask of you to keep an open mind to the new views and perspectives presented today. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for the support of the Center for the Jewish Future, for supporting all of our endeavors, and to Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Tendler for pioneering the field of Jewish medical ethics and allowing us to build an already concrete foundation. We are truly standing on the shoulders of giants. We would like to thank our society mentor, Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman, and our society's executive directors for their ongoing guidance and mentorship. The Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society is incredibly privileged to have the support of President Rabbi Berman, allowing the Medical Ethics Society to educate the student body and the Jewish community at large. We now would like to ask Rabbi Glasser, the Dean of the Center for the Jewish Future, to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society Annual Conference. It's so nice to see everyone here. Thank you so much for coming out on a uh, snowy and cold morning. And we are sure that the warmth and the inspiration of today's program will certainly uh, be overwhelming for all of us. It is a great privilege for Yeshiva University's Center for the Jewish Future to play a mentoring role in the development of this conference and in the Student Medical Ethics Society in general. And I'd like to thank Rabbi Arye Charka and Menachem Lewin and Rob Shore, who have guided the students through the organization of this event, and to Mr. Paul Glasser, who is instrumental in working with the students to develop the sponsorship that made this event possible today. We also want to thank Dr. Reichman for his ongoing support and mentorship for the Medical Ethics Society as well. But today's conference is really about the creativity and the ambition and the aspirations of our incredible Yeshiva University students. Where else can Jewish students walk the halls of their university and encounter on an informal and on a classroom basis the pioneers and the cutting edge experts in the field of medical ethics? This conference, its depth, its professionalism, its reach, reveal the unlimited capacity of the Medical Ethics Society students as our leaders of the next generation. This coming semester will be exactly 20 years since I personally walked into Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tendler's course on medical ethics. And I remember very vividly sitting in his class as Rabbi Tendler was sharing newspaper articles about a complex ethical question that arose relating to conjoined twins. And I remember sitting in the course feeling like we are in the presence of the ethicist, the doctor, and the posek, who was instrumental in guiding the resolution of this question. And it made such a profound impression on me and on all of the other students, this incredible combination of scholarship of talent, of conviction of principles, and the ability to navigate the challenges of the day with such a sense of insight and the ability to emerge with ultimately a pathway forward. This worldliness, this balanced with profound conviction, it's the imprint that Rabbi Tendler leaves on his countless students and especially on those who have entered the field of medicine and in the rabbinate. I'd like to thank this morning Dr. Marty Gewartz from the Community Synagogue of Muncie for his instrumental role in bringing together the celebration of Rabbi Tendler's contributions to the broader world and the Student Medical Ethics Society as an opportunity to recognize Rabbi Dr. Tendler's achievements in a manner that continues to inspire our students to perpetuate his work in confronting the challenges of medical innovation within the framework of halachic observance and of Jewish values. 
Today's conference is part of a very special year here at Yeshiva University. Only a few months ago, Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman was invested as Yeshiva University's fifth president. Rabbi Berman is a gifted leader, a gifted scholar, an orator, and he has a deep understanding of Yeshiva University and its unique culture, having graduated from four of its schools, earning his BA from Yeshiva College, his master's from the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, his rabbinical ordination from Reitz, following Reitz, studying in the prestigious Kolel Elyon, becoming an instructor of Talmud in the yeshiva, in 2000 becoming the rabbi of the Jewish Center in New York City, and after making Aliyah to Israel in 2008, completing his doctoral work in, with a PhD in Jewish thought at the Hebrew University of Yerushalayim. Rabbi Berman's vision for Yeshiva University and for our community is so focused on the world of tomorrow, on the challenges and the opportunities that it will bring to our students and to our community. And that vision is proudly manifest in the extraordinary work of our students in formulating and organizing today's conference. It is a great privilege and a wonderful pleasure to introduce Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Glasser. It's a great honor to uh, be here this morning. And I thank all of the organizers, the students, and professors for arranging this stellar and important event in our university uh, system. It's certainly an honor to always be in the presence of Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tendler, and especially this morning uh, for this uh, great uh, um, event in celebration of his wonderful, wonderful career. Uh, since the dawn of time, <clears throat> and the birth of literature, humans have been captivated by the possibility of finding new technologies that will enable them to create. Often these efforts are seen as running counter to the will of God, for man is exceeding his natural limitations and becoming too godlike. In the Greek tradition, for example, the fire stolen by Prometheus and the power of flight flaunted by Icarus were conceived of as a threat to the divine order. A fascinating counter tradition, however, may be found in the Babylonian Talmud. In Mesechet Sanhedrin, the Talmud relates, Amar Rava, Ibau Tzadiki Baru Alma. If the righteous want, they are able to create a world. The Gemara continues with a fascinating story. Rava Baragavra, Rava created a man. Shadra Lakame de Rabzeira, he sent the man before Rabzeira, Havikamishtai Bahadeh Blo Havikamahadrele. Rabzeira started asking the man questions and the man couldn't answer him. The man seemingly was mute. Amarle Min Chavraat Hadala Afraich, you were created just by man, go return to dust. So Rava, first of all, identifies very interestingly that it's the tzaddikim, it's the righteous that are able to create new worlds. And then also interestingly, the section continues with a peculiar story of Rava's creation not being able to answer Abzera and then being sent and discarded to return to dust. What is the message of this passage in the Gemara? Perhaps the Gemara is teaching us that human creation is not a threat to the divine if it is done correctly. In this case, it's the very stewards of Jewish tradition, the sages themselves, who are entrusted with the godlike capacity to create new life. For it is these sages who are best prepared to develop and maintain a morally mature perspective on the human-God relationship. Rava's creation, while great, is recognized by Reb Zera as paling in comparison to the real thing, and as such, it can be easily discarded. It is the sages who place their acts of creation in a larger theological and moral framework, 
understanding both their own capacities as well as their own limitations, who are said to be given this power to create. We are living in a remarkable time. Human innovation is proceeding at a remarkable pace, thereby enlarging by leaps and bounds our capacity to help others and improve lives across the globe. Today's conference discussing the technological frontiers in the health fields, from the CRISPR gene editing to augmenting neuroenhancers, implicates technologies that may even blur the line between improving human life and creating it. Should we regard such advances with suspicion? Do such technologies deify us? Do they turn human beings into gods? Yeshiva University in the grand tradition of Rav and Reb Zera represents a unique opportunity to both celebrate these new technologies and contextualize them. Standing at the nexus between heritage and pioneering, Yeshiva University is best prepared to appreciate that human innovation is a glorious gift from God, while simultaneously recognizing that it doesn't turn us into God. This conference is a great expression of Yeshiva University and what we stand for. We bring our 3,000-year-old tradition into the world of tomorrow. The field of medicine is changing quickly along with the new technologies and advances in science, and we must place these developments within the context of our values in order for us to best know how to incorporate them into our lives. This conference, as we said, is in honor of the person who for the last century best exemplifies the dual values of tradition and innovation. Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tendler has all his life brought the wisdom of our tradition to bear on the science of our day. As someone who models both sides of this coin, a first-rate Talmud Chacham and a stellar scientist, he has been a teacher and role model for generations of students. It is very fitting that this conference is in his honor, and we wish him arichat yamim, so that his students can continue to learn from him for many years to come. Thank you all for participating. I very much look forward to an enriching and fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Berman. Uh, I would now like to ask, uh, we have a, a gift of tribute uh, to both Rabbi Tendler as well as to Dr. Gewurz. Uh, for the last number of de decades, Yeshiva University has shared the wisdom and the presence of Rabbi Tendler together with the Community Synagogue of Muncie. And from Rabbi Tendler's shul, he has had the opportunity to inspire and uplift the broader community of Rockland County and beyond. And this past, uh, just a couple of months ago, there was a beautiful dinner uh, that celebrated his achievements and his accomplishments in the community. And this entire conference and the conference moving forward for quite a number of years uh, is in honor of Rabbi Tendler due to the love and affection, admiration and respect of his balabatim uh, in his shul. And so therefore, to represent them, we'd like to ask Dr. Gewurz to come up, as well as Rabbi Tendler, so we could present them uh, each with a gift on behalf of Yeshiva University in tribute to all you've accomplished. Actually, we'll, we'll come to you. Here we go. Kavod Harav Berman, Rashi Yeshiva, and most importantly, our Talmidim. I'd just like to remind uh, Rav Berman that man can create a man, but they can't count into a minion. <laughs> Kedusha comes only from Am Yisrael. Morim Brochos and Davches Miom Shechora Vibisa Migdosh Ain Lo La Kodesh Bohu El Dalet Amo Shela Locha Bulvad. I saw most of the people here will have no trouble understanding what Dalet Amos means. 
in your private property, in Rishus HaYochid, it all belongs to you. And your property is an extension of your hand. In Rishus HaRabim, you're competing for space. But everyone has Dalai Ramos, approximately seven feet of circumference around him. That area is your private property. Comes the Gemara and says, <clears throat> I don't want to know what you do when you're in the yeshiva. Tell me what happens when you go out into the Rosh Harabim. Do you still have your Dalai Amos there? What happens when our students leave the yeshiva, go to graduate schools, suddenly the world opens up and you find that there's competition between the Rishus HaRabim and the Dalal Amos of my Rishus. Yesterday, actually it's not yesterday yet, but it's this week, Yosef finally reveals himself to his, to, to his brothers in Parshas Vayigash. They come back to tell Yaakov, Oh, Yosef Chai, Yosef is still alive. Below him in them, he can't believe them. They lied to Yaakov once before when they made up this story about Yosef being attacked by a wild animal, therefore he did not return. Then Vayares Agolos, he saw the wagons that Yosef sent, and that convinced him that Yosef was alive. So Rashi, the Medalist, record, what's Agolos? They used to study together. And he sent as a message to Yaakov, I remember the last thing we studied together. We studied the halochos of Egla Rufa, of how the town has to behave when near that town a murdered individual was found. It's interesting, and I think this will be a bit of a chidush, a novelty for many people here. On Medel Shraba, there's a Rashi scattered very few times as Rashi comment on the Medel Shraba. On this, Agolos, the Medel Shraba says, Agolos, not Eglarufa, a story about a murdered man, Bayares Agolos, Agolos shel Mishkon. The Mishkon was built and then taken down many times. They had to have wagons. And the Nassim contributed the wagons, six wagons. Wagons were big wagons. They had a halachic rule of Rushus Hayochid, a private property. The desert in which they stood was public property. And the Gemara in Shabbos teaches us how do we know that it's forbidden on Shabbos to carry from a private domain to a public domain and vice versa? Because of the Agolos of the Mishkan, because the Agolos were Rishus Hayochid, were private property, and they lifted up the boards of the Mishkan to the wagon and from the wagon as Rishus Hayochid to Rishus Harabim, Rishus Harabim to Rishus Hayochid. I believe that's what Rashi says, Bayares Agolos, Yosef sent a message to his father Yaakov. I know the difference between Rishus Hayochid and Rishus Harabim. My Rishus Hayochid remained sacrosanct. Rishus Harabim was in the house of Paro, was in the country called Egypt, the Amaro country. But my Rishus Hayochid was the house of Yaakov. That remained. What happens when our Talmudim go out into the Rishus HaRabim? Suddenly, the world opens up, 
And sadly, some people spending years in yeshivas don't know how to cope with that world. And often they fall prey to the world at large. Pre-med society, before pre-med society, I can't, I can't even tell you when, because you won't believe me, uh, but it was in the 1950s that I began saying a shield for pre-med students after hours. It wasn't considered to be important enough to become a formal program for yeshiva. In 1957, the year I received my doctorate from Columbia, I began a formal shia in ethics of medicine. And now, a Talmud is challenged to such an extent that without these conferences, it's not possible for a student to be prepared to go to medical school. It's not possible for a student to go to graduate school because he never saw Shush HaYochid interacting with Rishush HaRabim. What's facing a Talmud now? There were words that have multiple meanings. It's far different to a Talmud, or it should be far different to a Talmud. There are challenging words today in medicine. Futile care. What's futile care? You have concepts that have to do with when is a person dead? Do not resuscitate orders. But there's more than that. There is the sociology of the outside world. And here our Talmudim, I must say, excel as I get feedback. I know that they're doing well in interpersonal relationship. Some who have seichel even make sure that Hanukkah has a box of candy for the nursing staff. The nursing staff is very valuable to a Talmud who needs a little help on Shabbos in order to observe the halachos. Is it possible for a full boy to go to medical school? Society demands it. It's critical for society to be able to see a little peek into our Rishus HaYochid, how a Talmud behaves. Balosres and Eros is associated with Hanukkah. Balosas and Eros, there's a wonderful quote. Right, I'd like to quote it directly. The Nitziv, the Hamek Dovo that many of you people study, says as follows. Kodesh Bo, who said to light the seven candles, right? You should know, he says, that they represent Sheva Chachmos. They represent all of human knowledge. And the old Greek system of dividing up all of human knowledge into seven components, right? Listen to this language. Shebeli Yidiya Bechola Chachmos, Iesha Lovo Lekama Ikriatova. Without knowing the outside world, Knowing all of wisdom, you can't know Torah. Actually, Goan preceded him, quoted by Raboruch Mishklov, who said the same thing. And if someone is not cognizant of the seventh Chochmos, he'll know far less of the Torah. What does that mean? The seventh Chochmos represent outside world. We have to learn to live in the outside world. But the important thing is to know El Mul Peneha Menoro Yeiru Shivas and Eros. They all have to face the central Menoro, which represents Torah. 
without outside the knowledge, it's impossible to understand Torah. Without the Torah, it doesn't pay to understand the outside knowledge. Who should watch over our Talmudim? They should continue to be a source of pride and joy to Am Yisrael, a source of personal nachas in their families. And thank you very much for an honor that was unnecessary. Every morning when I come to Yeshiva, I'm honored more than enough. Good morning, everybody. What a tremendous zchus and honor to be here uh, for a day uh, giving tribute to one of the icons of uh, the Torah world in general and one of the prizes of, uh, of Yeshiva University. Um, for this conference, I specifically want to point out the, uh, those who have uh, been responsible for this, the presidents of the Medical Ethics Society, Gav and Ellie, uh, and all the members of the Medical Ethics Society, a tremendous round of applause for all their, uh, their efforts in, uh, in putting this together. <clears throat> and Rabbi Berman, our new leader and the CJF, uh, instrumental in making these kinds of things happen. I say it every year, the Medical Ethics Society really is the, uh, the torch of, uh, of Yeshiva University, really uh, the uh, institution or the organization which uh, so embodies everything that we stand for. Uh, and Rabbi Tendler uh, truly embodies that uh, th more than anyone here at this, at this institution. And I have the pleasure of bringing Rabbi Tendler special regards and mazel tov from a dear colleague of his from Jerusalem. Uh, and I read for you, uh, dear Rabbi Tendler, along with countless, uh, countless others, I am privileged to add my mazel tov and congratulations on your receiving this well-deserved recognition and honor by Yeshiva University, Dr. Fred Rosner. Fred, uh, dear colleague and friend, of, uh, of Rabbi Tendler for many, many years is very, very excited and proud and, uh, and happy for you. Um, most professors, if they're lucky, get one conference in their honor. Uh, Baruch Hashem, the uh, Community Synagogue of Muncie has uh, sponsored five conferences because they know for Rabbi Tendler, <clears throat> one conference simply isn't enough. <clears throat> they actually say that imitation is the greatest form of flattery and uh, Rabbi Tendler has the distinction probably of being the most imitated professor in the history of Yeshiva University. Uh, but that's not what I mean. I don't mean his characteristics of imitation. I mean we imitate what he has begun back in the 1950s. All of us in the field of, uh, of medicine and halacha, we are genuinely imitating him. This uh, medical ethics conference is really a continuation of the work that he began. And we, uh, we owe a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude that we simply could never repay. And I just want to conclude my tribute to, uh, to Rabbi Tendler by saying they said of the Rambam, mi Moshe ad Moshe lo kum kemoshe. We could say that now, mi Moshe ad Moshe lo kum kemoshe, from Moses Maimonides to Rabbi Moshe Tendler. So we wish you many, many healthy years of happiness. <clears throat> I wanted to suggest, uh, and I'm glad Rabbi Berman is here as well, a new a logo for Yeshiva University, which I have up on the screen for you, uh, especially in light of Rabbi Tendler's presence. I think it so embodies everything we have to talk about, everything we have to say at these kinds of conferences, and the slogan would be, Torah is part of our DNA, and DNA or the study of Mada is part of our Torah. Uh, so I submit that for your consideration and I look forward to, uh, <laughs> to discussing it further. I do confess, by the way, this, uh, my session is specifically related to the tribute to Rabbi Tendler. It's about longevity and our objective is really purely selfish. Uh, we want to uh, give Rabbi Tendler a longevity gene so he will be with us for, for many, many healthy, happy years to come. Uh, I just want to really set the stage, give a little bit of uh, Jewish and halachic context uh, to an extraordinary speaker we are about to hear who's on the cutting edge of research into the world of longevity. Uh, and uh, I begin with this, uh, this cartoon, which uh, has a doctor speaking to a patient and says, I am writing you a prescription. Do you want a longer life with less quality or vice versa? 
And that really is one of the questions we need to address. But what I'd like to do is just to share with you uh, what the Jewish sources have to say about the world of longevity. Now, the Torah even tells us the secret to longevity. It gives us two mitzvahs so that we can perform. Uh, the mitzvah of Kibra Vaim, honoring our father and mother, and the mitzvah of Shiluah Hakein, sending off the, uh, the bird before we take the chicks. Uh, this, however, can't be the secret to extreme longevity, because in the last hundreds of years, even those who have observed this mitzvah have not been uh, the beneficiaries of great longevity. But we do have precedent in our literature, in our tradition, in our Mesora, of people living extremely long lives. We all know we're in the midst of Sefer Bracious that our, uh, that our ancestors, starting from Adam Harishon, lived uh, almost close to a thousand years. Uh, and as you see here on your, uh, on your graph of our, of our early ancestors, now some have suggested actually that perhaps those years were not real solar years. Maybe they were based on lunar months and maybe they were short periods of time. So the Abarbanel, for example, uh, says of Ahadas Hazeh Hu Chazov, to maintain that these were not actually full years uh, would be lying, would be inappropriate, and would be absolute falsehood. So how do our predecessors, how do the Rishonim explain this great longevity and explain its purpose and explain why it changed so that the longevity has decreased down to the maximum, if you will, of 120 years? Reb Sadigon, for example, suggested that the reason for the extreme longevity was to populate the world. People lived longer, had more children. Once that objective was accomplished, the lifespan was shortened down to the normal lifespan. The Rambam, however, maintains that only those specific people mentioned in the Torah lived those long lives, and the rest of the generations did not. And their longevity was either due to natural causes, them preserving their own health, or perhaps possibly due to uh, miraculous causes. The Ramban, however, says different. The Ramban says all people in those generations were privy to uh, extreme longevity. So what changed? Why did things go down? So he says the flood, the mabul, caused damage to the environment, which affected subsequent longevity. And if you look at the graph, you will see, it's actually quite remarkable. That red line that you see is the time of the mabul, and you will see a very gradual, though precipitous, uh, to, to some extent, drop from the years of, uh, of, say, Noah, who was born well before the flood, who lived till 950, to Shame, who lived 600 years, who was born just before the flood, to all those who were born after the flood, this whole column, significantly lower lifespan. So that's what the Ramban maintained. It's interesting there are those today who are beginning to explain what the Ramban said hundreds of years ago. <clears throat> so, for example, in an article in 1987 in the journal called Korot, a scientist, not referring to the Ramban, said that mycotoxins were released in the flood and decreased the lifespan of the human being. But apropos this particular conference, which talks about genetics and longevity, I want to share with you this uh, article by Natan Aviezer, The Extreme Longevity of the Early Generations in Genesis. And he comments on the fact also that things decreased significantly with the flood. And here is really his suggestion, which is quite a remarkable suggestion. He says that indeed, at the time of the flood, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the following pronouncement. After the flood, Vayomer Hashem lo yidon ruchi ba'adam le'olam b'shagam hu basar v'hayu yamav me'av esrim shana. That he says at the time of the flood already, God said, man's lifespan will be maximally 120 years. But what's interesting is that if you look at that chart that we had before, it's not a precipitous drop that went from 1,000 years to 120 years, but rather people lived 600 years, 500 years, 300 years, until it leveled off at 120 years. So here's his very novel suggestion, which bears direct relevance to us. It says, in the, light, in the light of earlier scientific discussions of aging, we propose that the divine pronouncement of Genesis 6-3 can be understood as meaning 
that at the time of Noah, the genes for aging were introduced into the human gene pool. That when HaKadosh Baruch Hu introduced the genes for aging, it took a number of generations for those genes to be transmitted until ultimately it became that man's maximal lifespan was, was a pure 120 years. By the way, we need to differentiate between longevity and aging. Longevity is the length of life. Aging is a different phenomenon. And in fact, according to our Mesora, it is Avraham Avinu who asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu that there be aging in the world because of an interesting uh, uh, experiment, if you will, or phenomenon that occurred just with him and his son Yitzchak. The Torah says, the Eila told us Yitzchak ben Avraham, Avraham holidus Yitzchak. So why the repetition? Rashi famously comments that, Avimel, that Avraham and Sarah were infertile for many years, and then they went to visit Avimelech, and shortly thereafter, Sarah became pregnant. And the late Sane Hador, the, some people said, well, maybe in fact, Sarah is pregnant from Avimelech, because Avraham was infertile all these years. So what Kadosh Baruch Hu did is he made Yitzchak appear identical to Avraham, literally identical. And Rabbi Sachs said, actually, from this podium at one of our conferences, that this was the first uh, case of, uh, of human cloning, that Kadosh Baruch Hu uh, had an experiment of human cloning. But Avraham didn't, wasn't so excited about this experiment. Why so? Because when people would come to visit him at home and want to do business with him, they'd start talking business with Yitzchak. And people came to play with Yitzchak. They saw Avraham. They thought it was the same person. They'd start to sit and play Legos with, uh, with Avraham. So it, the experiment didn't work out so well. So Avraham Avinu actually petitioned HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you have in your hand out here in the Gemara uh, in Sanhedrin, and he says, Ad Avraham lo hayazikna. You know, called the chazi la Avraham amar ha Yitzchak, et cetera, et cetera. So he actually requested from HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he introduce the concept of aging, that there not only be, uh, there, there's a difference obviously in their longevities, but the aging concept that people would actually age and differentiate between someone younger and someone older was introduced from the times of Avraham. Is longevity always desired? So here I share with you uh, uh, two brief sources. The Yalkut Shimoni says, Masab Isha Achas Sheiz Kina. There was a woman who became very, very old, and she went to Rabbi Yossi ibn Chalafta, and she says, I'm living too long. I do not want to live anymore. So he said to her, to what do you attribute your longevity? She said, I go to shul every single day and I never have missed davening in my life. So he said, absent yourself from shul for three days. And so she did, and she died on the third day. By the way, this is a source quoted very often by, uh, by Rabbi Tendler in discussions about the end of life. And the same is true in this, reflected in this source about the city of Luz. Luz was a very famous city that uh, uh, because of the schus that the people in the city of Luz made the tcheles for the tzitzis, the people in the city of Luz never died. They had extreme longevity. So what happened? So the Gemara says of those people that Malach Amavis wasn't even sholate on them. So what did they do? How did they end their lives? Zekenim shebabizman shedatam kotze alehem yotzim chutz lachom avahen mesim. They would leave the borders of the city when they felt their lives had been complete. And they died as soon as they left the borders of the city. Which implies that they didn't desire specifically extreme longevity, otherwise they could have kept, kept on living. Mir Hashem, in the times of the Mashiach, we will actually see extreme longevity. Bila hamavas lo netzach, umacha Hashem dima mi'al kol ponim, that uh, we will see a time in the times of the Mashiach that uh, there will no longer be death, and people will live extreme long lives. And just to, to jive this with the, uh, the Rambam, which we said, and this is an article by Aryeh Kaplan, who was ahead of his time uh, in many of his writings, he wrote, it is therefore particularly significant that Maimonides clearly states that in the Messianic age, people will enjoy extremely long lives because of their carefree existence. Since Maimonides consistently maintains that no laws of nature will be violated in the messianic age, one possibility is that there will be scientific or technological progress, though he makes no mention. So if you put this together with Natan Aviezer, that it'll be a natural process through which aging is uh, reversed and longevity will increase, 
And if we assume that a longevity gene was, was added to the population in the times of the Mabul, then perhaps in the research that we are about to hear presently, we are hearing about the reversal of this uh, decrease of our longevity, and maybe this is actually an indication that Mirza Hashem will be uh, seeing the coming of the Mashiach. I would now like to introduce our next uh, speaker who will address this issue of aging. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce her, then we're going to have a very brief 30-second uh, video as an introduction to, uh, to Dr. Cuervo. It is really an honor. She's from our institution, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and really one of the pioneers of, of aging research. Dr. Anna Maria Cuervo is the R.R. Belfer Chair for Neurodegenerative Diseases, Professor in the Departments of Developmental and Molecular Biology and of Medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, co-director of the Einstein Institute for Aging Studies. Uh, she obtained her MD and PhD in biochemistry at the University of Valencia. Many, many awards, and uh, you will be uh, astounded at the research that she is involved in to Mir Hashem bring the times of the Mashiach. I will now uh, put the video up for you, after which Dr. Cuervo will address us. Well, thank you very much for, for, for the nice introduction and, and the opportunity to, to be here. I you realize I don't see the screen, so I will have to go by, by what is in front of me. Is it projecting? Okay, good. Yeah, I'm too short for podiums. That's my problem. So, so it's a pity that you didn't see the clip because the, the students selected uh, as a very good way to introduce in proper English what I'm going to try to tell you in broken English. So just try to deal with my, my poor English and my strong Spanish accent uh, as we go through the, through the presentation. Uh, but um, as you hear, we, we are very interested in aging and trying to modulate aging. And the only thing that I can contribute to this audience is the view of a cell biologist uh, and an MD and a PhD, but I'm really a cell biologist by training, and what we think can be done about aging and why we want to do this. So there are one million definitions of aging, and each one has their favorite one. I particularly like this one that says that it's a series of gradual changes in the structure and function in the organisms that occur that are not related to disease. And I like the idea of gradual because you don't wake up and you are old. I mean, there is a process involved that gave us time to, to intervene. And then why we want to intervene? I mean, why we want to modulate aging? I think that the most important reason is also in this definition that is this loss of function. If we will be healthy and happy and running marathons when we are 90 years old, we will not mind to be 90 years old. But unfortunately, as you know very well, uh, there is a loss of function associated with the gradual pass of time. So this loss of function uh, has many implications. So one of them is imperativity, the, the inability to do things by yourself, uh, the loss of independence that affect your quality of life, but from the point of view of the medical field, the thing that worries us is that this loss of function also increase your predisposition uh, to disease. So the chances of getting sick uh, are re definitely higher. So, so how does, if we just put it in a graph, how, how to do age? So imagine, I mean, this is the, is the mouse? Can you guys see the arrow? So I don't think I can point from here, but uh, basically, uh, as you can see, wh when you age, normally you have functions, so this will be survival of function uh, in the Y, and then you have age, and you are fine, and you are functional, and then you have this gradual loss of function. And basically, you have 10, 15, 20 years that you are getting sick, you have less mobility, you decrease this quality of life that in the cartoon the doctor was trained to trade. Either you want to live longer or do you want to have good quality of life and live shorter. And what we are really trained to do, and, and it has been illustrated that there have been many examples of successful aging, is really try to mimic what happened with centenarians. So many of you are familiar, Einstein, we, we have the luxury to have a very comprehensive study following uh, Askanasi Jewish centenarians' families. And this is how they really die. So basically, they are healthy, 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 healthy. And then in two months, very similar to these three days of not praying, uh, the, the, these uh, individuals die. And this is basically what you will want. I hope that if they tell you, OK, you are going to die at 120, 
but the day before you are going to be running a marathon. I think we all will try, in my case it will be a miracle because I never run in my life, but, <laughs> but, but you know, you, you will trade for those kind of things to maintain proper function, who will care? And this morning when we, we were chatting on the corner, some people were like, well, the problem is that if you guys act successful and everybody lives longer, that's going to be a problem for Medicare, that's going to be a problem for social service. No, because people will be less sick, so you will be spending less money in Medicare and, and, and medical uh, and drugs and medicines. Uh, and also you will have functional people that can more actively contribute to other tasks in the community as they were doing when they were young. So, so I think that the key here is to kind of stop thinking about longevity. Whether or not you live longer, the most important thing to increase is the time that you are healthy. So you will see now that in, in many documents, instead of using the idea of lifespan, people start talking about health span. How long are you healthy in your life? And if your first disease started when you are 80 or when you are 90, that's a very successful life because you don't have these 20 or 30 years of deterioration. So, so with this uh, two graph basically illustrates a little what we want to do. And the reason, again, we want to do that because when you have this loss of function, these years of deterioration, you have a higher predisposition to disease. So as your function goes down, you become more frail, you become more fragile, and then you have all these age-related disorders that we continuously uh, see, unfortunately, in our uh, grandparents and in our society. A stroke, atherosclerosis, diabetes, Alzheimer, cancer. I mean, these are diseases of aging. And the idea is that if you can push this loss of function to make it flat, like in centenarians, you will not have this high incidence of these diseases. And then the other thing is that if you can push people to be stronger to have a better function, they will also deal with the disease if it happens in the way that young people did. So normally when you have someone young, you get sick and then you get cured and then you have another disease and you get cured. So basically there, there is this time of remission and then you are healthy again. Unfortunately, as you get old, the picture is a bit different. You get one disease before you get that one deal with, you have another disease and we might tackle, you go to the doctor and they might do something for your cardiovascular condition, but you still have these two underlying disorders or other conditions that are gonna keep debilitating. So, so the idea is that I think, or the medical community, uh, what we think is that maybe we should approach this different. Rather than going after every disease and then they will be the next one, maybe if we just uh, intervene in aging, if we intervene in this deterioration of function that is associated with aging, we will not have to treat every disease at a time. You will have the kind of response that you have in young people that the remission, the whole process is way faster. So this idea, of course, I'm not putting it forward as something that I came up, I, I'm not so smart, but um, it has become something that we talk a lot in the biomedical community interested in aging research. And actually there is this term that was coined that is this term of geroscience. And the idea behind, and I, you don't need to read all that, is that um, there is a clear relationship between aging and age-related disorders. And aging is the most important risk factor in all those disorders. And I think, for example, if you ask the population, you think about cancer. Normally, if you ask in the street, oh, what is the highest risk of cancer? Most people say get smoke or because of cigarettes, because but that will be for lung cancer. But when you think that for pediatric cancers, instead for cancers that only occurs in kids, as you get old, the, the, the probability of getting cancer is higher. So aging is really the higher risk factor of cancer. And in this new concept of geroscience, is catalogized as an age-related disorder. So, so again, the idea is to really uh, do any kind of research or biomedical interventions that can help us to change for this very uh, um, flat, I mean, this slope in which you have this deterioration for years to this more centenarian-like uh, form. So, so that kind of have gave rise during the last 10 years to this new idea of the molecular basis of aging. Uh, and what we can contribute, and I say with like, the people who, who does basic research, as is my case, is trying to identify what are the molecular and cellular mechanisms 
that contribute to aging, because those are the ones that we think uh, we can interview, we can modulate, and then you can might be able to reach this flat shape and then fast drop as we are aiming for. So um, this idea, as I say, is not new, but there has been, uh, it has helped uh, to conceptualize it in some clear ideas of what contributes to aging. I'm talking about cellular and molecular processes, and that sounds like very abstract. So interestingly enough, uh, five, four years ago, in both parts of the Atlantic, there was this interest in trying to define a little better what are the molecular changes, what are the cellular processes that we should tackle to really uh, affect aging. And of course, everybody is passionate about their own research, and you can come out with 200 different processes. But there was people that uh, got together, so in the case of the European part, they came up with this very colorful graph that corresponds to nine pillars of aging, nine cellular processes that contribute to aging. In the American part, when we got together, I think we were into the crisis, so instead of nine, we came up with seven. And, and I think that there is no difference in whether there are nine, there are seven, there are gonna be probably 20. But having this conceptual frame, having the idea that there are several things that you can intervene and can modulate the process of aging is giving us already a way to work and focus our research and our medical practice trained to add on those ones. And when you look at these two graphs, I mean, even the, these meetings and everything was done separately, we all came up with very similar uh, points. Uh, the only thing is, I know that European is more colorful, I still like ours better, the American one, because of the lines. I mean, it's not only patriotism, but when you look, it has these lines connecting these different processes. And I think that's very important, because that means that everything, as you know, in the organism is very interrelated. So the beauty is that if you affect or you have a positive impact, if one of them, you might have beneficial impacts in all the others. So, so the, the, the effect, the result that you get is gonna be exponential when you are only acting in a couple of them. Basically, we don't have to cure every single thing. We don't have to fix each of these processes because they are interconnected enough that if one works better, it's gonna have a positive impact in the others. And then just to give you a feeling of what are we thinking, and again, I mean, th this might be more technical, but just so you get an idea of the kind of cellular processes that we are interested, that I imagine that in a couple of years they, they will be different ones. So for example, stem cells. So everybody's familiar that we all have stem cells because when you get damage in any of your organs, for example, in your muscle, your stem cells are gonna repair it. So basically, you, you have the potential of regeneration and repair inside your body. And it's very clear that as you get old, you have less ability because your stem cells are not so well preserved and they don't function so well. You also have the uh, other markers, for example, epigenetics or genetics. So, so these are modifications in your genes that are associated with higher risk of factors uh, for particular diseases and also related or not with longevity. And, and I will give you some examples. You also have processes like metabolism. So the, the European part divided into nutrient sensing and mitochondria, that is the center of energy in, in your cells. Uh, we just talk about metabolism in general. And this goes in what my father always say, you, you are what you eat. So, so I think this is part of it. I mean, nutrition is so important in our life that it has a big impact also in the rate that we age. And these are, as you can already know, that these are not new concepts, but at least you have now cellular processes or organism processes that you can follow. For example, damage. I think many people is familiar with the concept that as you accumulate damage, uh, probably you are gonna have higher chances of mutation and deterioration of your DNA, or you are gonna have higher chances of disease associated to particular damage. So of all these, these processes, I'm gonna be telling you about the one that probably sounds less appealing. You are like, why is this woman talking about this? That is called proteostasis. So proteostasis is a process that was defined as something important for aging in both parts of the, of the Atlantic and that I happen to be working in. And it sounds very weird word and you know, that's how it goes, but basically it's to keeping your cells clean. And I think cleaning is something that is very important for everybody, but also for every cell in your body. So I'm gonna illustrate with a series of examples, and if it gets very technical, I have somebody that in the back is gonna wave to me to move faster. 
if needed. Uh, but just to give you a flavor, uh, and as I say, I, I cannot contribute at, at the level that the other speakers have, have been talking. I, I, don't, I don't have the, the, their capacity. So I can just give you a flavor of what we are doing as basic scientists trained to modulate this aging and whether or not there is some chances of success. So again, back to this proteostasis funny word. So proteostasis is just the fancy way that we use to talk about protein homeostasis. As you know, your cells are full of proteins, and normally when we depict a, a cell, we always make it look like a fry egg. It's like you have the nucleus, and then you have things floating around. But that's not really true. When, when you really look at the microscopic level, things are extremely, extremely cramped inside the cell. I mean, everything is in contact. The amount of molecules, I mean, when you zoom it out, you can see. So you have organelles, you have proteins, you have fat, you, you have one million things there that each of them have to be properly coordinated to make sure they don't interact in an abnormal way and make a mess with the other one or they don't interfere with the functions of the others. So the cells need a stream accurate quality control system. And this is what its proteostasis is about, basically to prevent this aggregation, to prevent abnormal things, and to maintain proper quality control as in any factory and in, a, in any other thing. So you have to make sure that everything is properly done and everything is moving and folding and going where it should go. So all the cells in your body have this proteostasis network that is just a series of proteins and systems that are gonna make sure that proteins behave. And for a protein behave is basically to make sure it's properly fold, as the typical origami thing, and that there are not sticky parts that are gonna mess a mess, are gonna make a mess in this very, very crowded environment. So what do we have to deal with this? So what, with this, uh, what, what is the quality control? So imagine that you have, everybody has here about free radicals. So for example, your mitochondria, as they produce energy, they are gonna have a lot, they are gonna produce free radicals. So chances of damaging a protein are relatively high. So once you damage a protein, so a fun functional protein in this cartoon will be something properly full, and then if it's damaged, it's gonna unfold. And the problem with this unfolding is that it's gonna, uh, stick, it's gonna present these very sticky areas, these red areas, that are gonna make proteins to get together one to each other. So how does the cell deal with that? So you have chaperones, and basically what they are gonna do is train to fold the protein. So if you can fold it, that's the end of the problem. Or you, if you cannot fold it, you send it to degradation. And that's where you have the proteolytic systems. So these chaperones and proteolytic systems are in place and function in every cell in your body, uh, when you are young and when you are healthy. However, as you get old, it turns out that the chaperones sometimes get distracted, they don't function so well, and sometimes the proteolytic systems, the things that have to remove these garbage containers, cannot really remove all these proteins, and they, they start accumulating. So then you end with these aggregates, and then you have all these chaperones and all these components. And again, this is sounded is like, oh, what is this woman going with all this aggregation? What does it have to do with disease? So it has to do with disease because many of the diseases that we consider of aging have as a basis problems with this protein aggregation, and you are gonna recognize the names. And for example, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington. These are diseases of the brain in which a protein fails to, fails to properly fall and it's gonna start accumulating. And it's like having little stones in your brain inside your neurons. The same thing for other diseases. I don't want to give the idea that this is only related with the neck and above. Uh, when you look, there are forms of diabetes that are related with problems with handling insulin inside the cells, or muscle disorders, or um, problems with anemia. So, so there are many, many diseases, many more that you, you can think of that are related with these problems in maintaining proper quality control. So the idea of, of our lab is really to try to understand how this cleaning happens, and basically, you know, like in everything, the cells have many different ways. The same thing that you have at home, that you have the brooms, you have the vacuum. So the cells have also many different systems, and our labs are interested in looking at those systems and trying to modulate them. So I'm gonna give you an example to make it more scientific. So for example, if you have an unfolded protein and you have to destroy it, you can put it to this kind of food processor. It's called the proteasome, so the protein goes from the top, chop, 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 and then you just get it in pieces. Or you have a whole organelle that many of you remember from your biology classes, 
that people used to call the garbage container, these lysosomes, that are going to be able to take all these aggregates and all these organelles that don't function and continuously eliminate it. And this process is what is known as autophagy. That is the idea of eating yourself, but only eating the bad things to just break them down, eliminate them from the cell, and then obtain energy. So the research that, that we're doing in, in the lab is really focused in this autophagy. And we just have a, a, the same thing that people from the other parts of these uh, nine processes of aging. So we just have three very basic questions. First, we want to know why autophagy. We, we show when I was still young, we show that autophagy decreases as you get old. So, so now the question is why? I mean, we have to, to know why, what are the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms that are, are, are responsible for that decrease. Then the second question is like, should we even care? I mean, should you care that your autophagy doesn't work? And then if we really care, because it turns out to be important, the most important thing, can we fix it? Can we contribute to improve proteostasis out of this charge of processes of aging to have a positive impact in the, others, in, in the other processes? So to know how it works, uh, I'm just going to show you one very simple cartoon. So imagine that this is the protein that you want to eliminate. So normally, as I say, when the protein is unfold, it exposes this sticky area. You have a chaperone that goes there. It's going to bring it to this garbage can, to this receptor, this LAM2A. And then basically, this is going to form a little hole to make it go inside, so then it can be choked. So I made this cartoon to tell my father what I work in. And he was not impressed. 25 years for this. So, so it's a little more complex than this orange ball. But you know, in a way, it's simple. I mean, and we need to know each of these different components if we want to know why it doesn't work. So it happened that as simple as this model is, we found that this blue protein, this receptor that then makes a channel, uh, actually decreased with age. So if you look, for example, you just have to trust me on this, this black band corresponds the amount that you have of this receptor when you are young. So this is in mouse, and at the bottom is in people. So when you are 25, you have tons of this receptor. You have tons of this blue band. As you see, when you reach 65, this is starting to go down. So of course, these are all just technical details, but we need to know how things work if we want to fix it. And this is basically what we have been doing, trying to understand why this, this pathway doesn't work. But then the other question is, like, OK, I can be very passionate about this because I identified this receptor, and you know, I have a whole lab studying it. But should we care that autophagy or, or this process of cellular cleaning decrease with age? So the best way to convince ourselves is just take only that part of aging, only these problems with cleaning, put it in a young animal, and see how much of aging this reproduce. Because this will tell us, OK, if you modify this system, how much of the process of aging can you find? So to do that is when we do genetics, and this is work from a very talented student in the lab, Jamie Snyder, an MD-PhD, that basically what she did, if you remember, this receptor, this channel is the one that decreases as you get old. So what she did is like, let's eliminate it in a young animal and see what happened. And of course, she did it in liver, so we have the possibility to then study what happened in each of the organs of your body. That becomes important for the relation to disease. So she did the liver one, and now we have a zoo. So we have specific for the brain, for the muscle, for the adipose. So we can study all these different organs. And I'm just going to show you one piece. For example, if we just take this cleaning system in the brain of the animals. So all the other things are fine. This is a young animal, no mutations, nothing. And we just took this cleaning system. And as you will see here, so in the top, you have a normal animal. When you grab it from the tail, spread the legs. I mean, this is like, please leave me on the floor. And this is the normal reaction. When you look at, we only took out the cleaning system. These animals are just hanging there. They cannot really move. And this is what an old animal will do. And when you look at the molecular level, you start seeing, and you will see in the cartoon, so the picture at the bottom, you will see these red things. So those are aggregates of proteins that are happening in the brain of these very young animals. So just by taking out the cleaning, you are making their brain to look old. So of course, then we have done for all the organs, and we can reproduce many aspects of aging. But this is kind of depressing. I'm telling you, we are all going to get old. 
our receptors are going to go down, your clinic systems are down, so what can we do? And, and this is really what we are really putting all the effort. So at this moment, we, what, I mean, the idea is can we fix this problem? And if we can fix it in an animal, can then we do it in people? So like everything in science, we, we do genetic approaches to make sure that there is a proof of concept that fixing this problem is going to have a beneficial effect, but then at the end of the day, we have to move into drugs, into chemical compounds that we will be able to give to the patients. So in the next three slides, I'm just going to show you a little the basis for the genetics. So um, the, the, the best thing that we have is that, as I say, our whole goal is to try to make uh, people to look like centenarians. But at Einstein, uh, thanks to Nir Barzilai and, and many others that have contributed to create this study, we have the luxury to have samples and individuals that are uh, centenarians. So we can compare if whatever we are looking is of, uh, it happens in centenarians. So for example, we were able to get cells from centenarians and then look at the levels of this receptor. And these are people from 65 years old, and these are centenarians. So the centenarians have better levels of this receptor. So this is terrific because when you look, their cells clean much better and they don't have all these aggregates. So that means that this is something that is contributing through their longevity and through increasing health span. So that's terrific for the centenarians. But unfortunately, most of us, we cannot change our parents now, right? And if they are not centenarians, you are not going to have the good genes that centenarians will have. So the rest of us will just have to try to find ways in which we can reach something similar through interventions. And as I say, as a proof of principle, what um, um, uh, Imma did uh, was to really uh, study, uh, try to create an animal in which she was preventing this decrease in the cleaning system. So normally, as I say, by middle age, you have this decrease in the cleaning. So what she did, we have interventions that then we can put an extra copy of this gene, so now they will maintain good cleaning through life. And then, because I'm not getting any younger, I was like, okay, that's fine, but I might have passed already this mid-age. So what happens if we do it later on? I mean, is there hope for people who have passed already the point? Because these animals never saw a decrease. They just keep going fine. So then we did another group in what we basically can do interventions later and see if these still have beneficial effect. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but this is what happened with longevity. So in orange, in blue, are the regular animals. In orange are those ones that you prevent the decline in cleaning. And both in males and females, we have an increase of 20% in lifespan. But what is better, when you look at the top of the graph, the health span, the time that they are healthy, is also higher. So they start to look a little more like the centenarians. And then we check function. So there are one million things that you can check. The one that got very excited, the people in my lab, especially the guys, is boldness. I mean, something as silly, we were talking about quality of life, but apparently guys don't deal very well with the loss of hair. So when you look at these animals, both males and females, actually, they preserve the hair for longer. And I just put the hair as something anecdotic, but you know, they have higher mobility, they have letter, uh, less incidence of disease, less fibrosis. So, so in a way, just by genetically modifying this, this particular pathway, we can do that. But as I said, you, you are not going to be doing genetics in an 80-year-old person so this person can live longer. So at the end of the day, what we have to develop is chemical compounds. And I'm just going to skip this part because I see the people waving at, at the bottom. But basically, we have now developed some drugs that can activate this pathway. And that when we try, for example, we are trying now in regular all animals. But to put it in the context of disease, we use an Alzheimer mouse model of disease. Um, basically, when you compare three months of treatment, this is the animal that was just hanging there. You gave it the drug and it started to be like healthy and, I mean healthy, at least uh, is recovering the, the, the muscle system, the contractibility, and most important, is recovering the memory. And I can tell you how we measure the memory any other time. But the idea is that by knowing what are the molecular bases, we can really develop at the end uh, tools and interventions that can span the lifespan. So again, to go back to this idea that aging is not a single factor, we have modified proteostasis. We have only modified cleaning in these animals. But when we look at metabolism, they are much better. They are not diabetic. They, they handle much better uh, fat and sugar. Their stem cells are much better. So we are also affecting stemness. 
we look at inflammation and accumulation of damage is less, obviously, and when we look at inflammation, it's better. So we, we intervene in one pathway and we have a high beneficial effect. So, so I think this is a, an important concept that by understanding how these things uh, interconnect, we might be able to, to push to a successful aging or something more similar to what we have in centenarians. And then this is basically just to really acknowledge the terrific team that I have in, in the lab. These are the current members, uh, the picture of the ones that are now there. We don't go dressed like that to the lab, but this was for a, for a match, a soccer match. Um, and then uh, we are extremely, extremely fortunate to always have the, the support of, of the school, of Albert Einstein, and also all these foundations who gave us the money. And I just want to, to leave you with this quote that I think it, it goes very much into what we want to do. And this is for one of the centenarians that says, that the trick is not to stay young, but really the trick is aging well. So, so I hope we can contribute to do that. Thank you for your attention. I'm Dr. Cuervo and to Dr. Reichman. Unfortunately, Dr. Reichman had to leave early, but we do have time for a few questions. So if anyone has some questions for Dr. Cuervo, now's the time. back. Hi, thank you. I'm wondering if the effects of stress, which are well known to affect health, is replicate, are they similar in a young person who's expecting, who's experiencing great stress as in the changes you're describing? Yeah, so, so that's a, a really good point. And actually we are, as we speak, uh, there is another meeting that we are having for the geroscience to include psychological factors. I think as a cell biologist, we always think in molecular processes that you can touch, but there is a stream uh, line of evidence showing that emotional stress, psychological stress have a tremendous negative impact in longevity. And those studies have been done with populations that are in poverty, with people that have been under oppression or just like regular abuse. So, so with the stress, that's the main problem that part of the aging is an inability to respond to stress. So this continuous sustained high level of stress definitely contributes to aging. So yeah, m many people tell me I'm, I'm a very stressful person. So, so I think being in my lab will not be a good therapy <laughs> because we are very stressed. But I, I think that there are many different ways and people talk about meditation and you know, there, there is some good into that because when you push a, a level, it's like everything, like the typical concept of hormesis. A little is good because it puts your defense up to, to a speed. When you pass a threshold, this can really compromise and shorten your lifespan. So, so I think there are, I mean, I, and I just want to clarify, I, I talk about drugs because, you know, most of the population is gonna want a pill that they can take and be healthier. But I think there are many lifestyle interventions that we all can do that is gonna have the same impact. All these cleaning systems are very related with nutrition. So, you know, if, if you don't eat so much, probably you are gonna activate these systems. If you exercise, you activate these systems. If you sleep for a long, I mean, as usual, like seven hours, you have time to clean in and you activate these responses to, to this damage. So, so I think there are tons of interventions that will not require appeal. So, on this side. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the biology is very elegant, but you didn't comment about environmental pollutants or other toxins. How does this interface with your model? Yeah, so, so actually we said with Ed when they were talking about the flood and how that the, the short span historically, and I think there are many aspects why, why the environment will, will affect. Uh, so for example, all this response to stress and response to damage, I mean, I, I was making it sound like, okay, you have the mitochondria, and because you have these nutrients, you are gonna have free radicals. If you go to the beach and get exposed to UV, you are gonna have the same kind of free radicals. So the environment is gonna have a big impact. And then they were talking about the, the microbes that can be there, and something that is now, as you know, getting a lot of momentum is the microbiota, the bacteria that is in your body and that has to adapt to the way that you are and contributes to what you are, basically. So I think that one is the environmental component that is also extremely important. In our case, we, as scientists, we always try to simplify. So our animals will be in a very controlled environment. But for example, Fernando Macian, my husband, is challenging these animals now with different infectious 
uh, agents or with radi radiation, and they've seen these guys that have better cleaning, they seem to be more resilient, they respond better. So, so I think that this interaction with the environment might also get improved if you attack these molecular processes. Very good question. Thank you much. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions left on this panel. But thank you very much again to Dr. Cuervo and Dr. Reichman. Hello, my name is Chaim Sandler, and I'm the Vice President of the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society. Today, we have the opportunity to learn about a, a remarkable new medical technique in the field of genetics, CRISPR gene editing. Tremendous possibilities arise with CRISPR, and as the old adage says, with great power comes great responsibility, and inevitably bioethical dilemmas and quandaries arise. For this panel, we are fortunate to be having Dr. Edward Burns, the Executive Dean of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, moderate this discussion. Dr. Burns oversees the policies relating to the responsible conduct of research and biomedical ethics at the Einstein Medical School. Dr. Burns is, is a graduate of Yeshiva University and received his MD degree from Einstein. He has authored over 50, 50 publications, holds five patents for his own inventions, and was awarded Einstein's Lifetime Achievement Award. In this panel, we will be hearing from Rabbi Dr. J. David Bleich and Dr. Neville Sanjana. R Rabbi Dr. Bleich is a Rosh Yeshiva of Reit and an authority on Jewish law, ethics, and bioethics. Rabbi Dr. Bleich has written extensively on the application of Jewish law to contemporary social issues and is a Woodrow Wilson Fellow and a member of the Governor's Commission on Life and the Law. Dr. Sanjana is an assistant professor of biology at New York University and a core faculty member and assistant investigator for the New York Genome Center. Dr. Sanjana's research focuses on understanding the impact of genetic changes on the nervous system and cancer evolution. He received his PhD in Brain and, and Cognitive Sciences from MIT, a BS in Symbolic System, and a BA in English from Stanford University. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Burns. Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here once again to the Medical Ethics Society. My congratulations to all of the students who are part of the MES. You have done for the last 11 years an extraordinary job. Continue to do so. You have a publication now. You're the co-sponsor of Rapoi Rape, that famous volume that's done between Einstein and Yeshiva of Medical Ethics. So I had actually hoped that Rabbi Tendler would be here because I have a couple of uh, things to say. Um, and I'm sure he'll come back, so maybe Mrs. Fried will be able to convey uh, my thoughts, because I don't want to take up much time. So, 46 years ago today, in this room, I took my biology final with Rabbi Tendler, Dr. Tendler, as my teacher. It was a killer. It was an absolute killer. It was four questions, and it was an essay. And <coughs> I looked at all four questions, didn't have a clue how to answer. Nevertheless, I got here anyway, after all that. Uh, so just don't be discouraged. Uh, and what Rabbi Tendler did at that time is he made us think of the answers as opposed to wrote choice A, choice B, choice C. So he made his biology class very similar to his Talmud class. And I was Zoha, of course, to be a Talmud in his shear as well. So I had him both as a Rebbe and as a biology teacher. That type of critical thinking that we have in the Talmud was made me an expert or tried to be an expert in terms of biology and science, so I all, owe all of that to Dr. Tandler. In 1959, a book was published in the UK called Jewish Medical Ethics, and it was by Lord Emanuel Jakubowicz, and that was the first or birth of Jewish medical ethics. But, as it turns out, in the United States, at the same time, there was a parallel development. Ah, here comes our attendant. There was a parallel development of Jewish medical ethics, and it was sired by Dr. Tendler. So in the 1960s and 70s, Rabbi Tendler, Rabbi Tendler, not Dr. Tendler, Rabbi Dr. Tendler, um, 
was a consultant to the Jewish Federation, and he gave Psak Halacha for Mount Sinai for all the places that began to think of Jewish medical ethics. But Jewish medical ethics in those days was more about keeping Shabbos, about abortion, some very, very basic, basic issues that related whether Jewish observant people should be going into medicine. And you heard him today, this morning, that he's been a forceful advocate for boys and girls to go into medicine. So I have three things to thank Dr. Tendler for. Number one, as I've just mentioned, 46 years ago today, in this room, 501, I took your biology final. It was a killer. Two, he was my Rebbe. And third, equally important, is he introduced me to his schwer, Rav Moshe Feinstein, so that I learned several years with Rav Moshe Feinstein. So I consider part of my greater development to be totally dependent and appreciative of Rabbi Tendler. So I think we're ready to go. We're going to have a presentation about CRISPR, and I'm sure most of you have not thought about CRISPR, except for that plastic bin in the refrigerator, but we're gonna get a little bit more complicated and talk about CRISPR. So Dr. Sanjana is going to make a uh, presentation, but because I know and that he is a very sophisticated scientist, for the dumb people in the audience like me, I just want to sort of simplify a explanation of what CRISPR is. So if you can see our picture DNA, the stuff that genes are made of, as a zipper, and the zipper gets zipped and unzipped and it works smoothly, and when all of that works just perfectly, we have normal health, we have normal reproduction, etc. But if one of the teeth of that zipper is malfunctioning or is the wrong tooth, then we have problems. So we have diseases like sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs, etc., that are genetic diseases because one of these teeth are either missing or it's the wrong tooth. CRISPR is the most powerful tool, most amazing scientific advance in my uh, experience over the last 30, 40 years. So I would say in the last half century, stem cells and CRISPR will turn out to be the two most important things in life in terms of medicine and biology. Now we're all awaiting what's gonna happen with stem cells. We've heard, we keep hearing about it. When is it gonna happen? Probably another 10 years of development before we get products. With CRISPR, I think it's gonna go much faster. So what is CRISPR? So let's say you unzip the zipper and you have a way of extracting the bad tooth and putting in a good tooth and then it zips perfectly. CRISPR is that tool that will allow us to actually change the course of disease, change the course of reproduction, and it's an amazingly powerful tool. You'll hear all about it today from Dr. Sanjana, but there are ethical and moral questions, and I will be posing some of these questions to him and Rabbi Blythe. To say, by the way, just for people who are cognizanti, to have Rabbi Tenlin and Rabbi Blythe in the same room is an extraordinary chus for us because these are the two giants of medical ethics in the United States, Jewish medical ethics. So Dr. Tenjan, please. Great, thank, thank you so much for that introduction and, and thanks to uh, this, this society here for inviting me today. It's my first time at Yeshiva University and it's been uh, a lot of fun so far to be here. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the panel discussion and um, also, actually, the zipper analogy I really like. I've, you know, as somebody who works uh, in this area of science, we're always looking for better and better analogies to explain things like gene editing or genome engineering to folks. And that, you know, I feel like I've heard pretty much every CRISPR analogy, but I have not heard that one. So that's that's a really nice novel one. Um, I might steal that. So, uh, I came here to New York about a year and a half ago. I started my lab at the New York Genome Center, which is a place in Soho and also in the Department of Biology at NYU. Prior to that, for about 15 years, I was in Boston uh, working in uh, science there. And so I'm gonna tell you about some work that we started a few years ago that really, I think, um, has kind of jumped from just being uh, purely known by scientists or molecular biologists really to the wider world um, uh, and, and uh, hopefully convince you of its, of its impact. So, one way to, I think, before getting into biology and DNA and, and zippers is we can think about a natural analogy of another um, form of information storage. So, I mean, we store information for um, 
hundreds of years in books and perhaps for a few decades now in digital format on the internet with computers. And we have advanced tools for manipulating that information. We have card catalogs for these um, large libraries, like this is the Portuguese library in, in Brazil, actually. Um, we have things like Wikipedia, which uh, even when I was growing up and my parents were considering to buy an encyclopedia, there's no encyclopedia that we could have bought at that time that equals the content that we can find today online in something like Wikipedia. And of course, we have just many ways to access this information. We all have iPhones, things like this. Um, it really uh, is amazing how well we can manipulate um, written information. But uh, as kind of a contrast, until recently, the language of biology, the language of, of life, um, uh, DNA, something that um, uh, all of us have learned about in, in, in high school biology, the language that, that programs all living things, we really haven't had a way to either read or write it very well until recently. And um, with the Human Genome Project, which is a tremendous investment that was made by the U.S. government and actually a few other governments, uh, culminated in, in the year 2000, 2001 with a full, the first full human genome. And really, that's one, one kind of cool achievement on the reading DNA side, but kind of the, the bigger achievement was the technology that brought us there enabled us to read not just one genome, but over the next 15 years, um, many, many other human genomes. But what's, uh, you know, with books, with the internet, reading and writing, we think of these as almost symmetric things. We can do both of them so easily. Uh, but the reading part, as I said, about 15 years ago, we, we started getting pretty good at it, and then um, better, better, and better. But the writing, um, it hasn't been symmetric. So we haven't had that ability to easily write uh, the language of DNA, which, just to explain this slide if you're wondering, is, uh, can be kind of represented by these four bases, as we call them, A, T, C, and G. So, so what does it take to write DNA, this, this kind of more recent advance? And um, you'll hear me refer to this term genome engineering, genome editing. What, what do I mean by that? Uh, genome uh, engineering, as we perform it today, takes advantage of natural gene repair mechanisms. So we just heard this wonderful talk on aging, and it's very important as um, as we age or when we're young, uh, we're exposed to many things like environmental mutagens, like UV radiation from walking outside. Our cells have a lot of processes to repair any breaks in the zipper, any, any mistakes that can accumulate as we age. And that's important because that's what keeps us, lets us actually age. Um, so genome engineering, as, as performed today by, by scientists, actually takes advantage of these natural DNA repair processes, often called double strand, because you think of the two strands of the zipper, double, um, double strand uh, repair pathways to introduce novel sequences. And I'm showing a little bit of a perhaps dated example, almost 20 years old now, um, of taking a fluorescent protein from jellyfish. And I don't know if any of you have had, I'm sure you've seen these in aquariums, but um, for instance, where I was living for a while in Boston, if you go out to Woods Hole on, um, uh, on the Cape, you can, uh, actually there are these areas where they have jellyfish that don't sting you, but you can grab them out of the water, and if it's really dark, you shake them up, and if you look at them like this, you can see some fluorescence. Maybe some of you have done this yourself with the non-stinging jellyfish. So these, these jellyfish, they make a protein that's this fluorescent protein. And what I'm showing you here is actually a picture I took while I was a PhD student of mice um, that we were using uh, for, for neuroscience, actually, where this protein from jellyfish had been transferred into the mouse. And you can see the green mouse versus its wild-type litter mate, brother or sister, that doesn't have the gene. And so this is, this is kind of very concretely one example of taking a gene that's perhaps not that useful, makes fluorescent skin, basically, and putting it in, into the mouse. But we can think, and I'll show you some examples later, of genes that you know, somebody who's sick might be lacking, and to be able to move that in, of course, uh, where, especially where there's no other treatment, is, is huge. Okay, so um, I'm gonna avoid being too technical, but to explain to you what's really the revolution of CRISPR of these last few years, um, we, it really is this idea of natural gene repair pathways to introduce these sequences and to trigger those kind of natural gene repair pathways we actually have to make 
a cut in DNA. We have to make a cut in DNA. And so the analogy I'm going to I'm going to tell you about is CRISPR really or these uh, these tools as really a pair of molecular scissors. So by making a cut in the DNA, they trigger these natural gene repair pathways. And so um, you'll have to adapt now to, from zippers to my analogy, which is scissors. And it's hard to really overstate the impact this has had on biomedical science. Um, this is, uh, you can see this from these two articles in the journal Science and in, in, in the world of scientific publications, the more general sounding the journal title is, the more important it is. So if it's science or nature, you know it's important. Anyways, okay, so these are both in science. And you can see here on, on, on the right side, they've named this technique, this uh, CRISPR technique, the 2015 breakthrough of the year. So it's something that's not just the gene repair people are concerned about, but it's really changed the way almost all biologists think and do science because everything runs on DNA. It's the common language. And you know, to, to kind of drive home this, this idea, I really like this, this one um, quotation from Hank Greeley, who's a bioethicist at Stanford. He said, the Model T wasn't really the first car, but it changed the way we drive, work, and live. And as an analogy, CRISPR has made this difficult process of genome editing cheap and reliable. So it's kind of like the Model T of genome editing, which if you think back to Model T times, it shows you how much progress probably we still have to make and where we are relatively in this kind of historical progression. Okay, so I think the most technical slide I have is next, but um, it's to explain to you why uh, this has had such an impact on the writing of DNA, it's important to give you some tiny context of what we were doing in the dark ages of four or five years ago. So we did, as of about 20 years ago, start to develop as a community, as a field, and I was involved in the tail end of this frustrating period, um, other technologies, and I put two of them up here. Um, the names are not important, zinc finger nucleases and tail nucleases, but there were other programmable scissors to find regions in this large genome. Oh, something I didn't mention. So in each of those cells, the trillions of cells that make up you, in each one of those cells, there's, as you know, a complete blueprint to make you. And that blueprint, it's not too small. It's pretty big. It's three billion letters long, three billion A's, T's, C's, and G's. So one huge problem, as I told you, is we need to make these cuts to trigger the, the gene repair pathways. How can we make the cuts in a precise way? And so starting about 20 years ago, there were technologies to program the scissors to make cuts in certain locations in the genome. The problem is, is that programming those scissors in the things that are on the, I think, left side of the slide required us to build new proteins, to do protein engineering. And you're just going to take my word for it that protein engineering is difficult. And the quantum leap forward with CRISPR is that the protein component, the scissors themselves, are generic, but they're programmable. And that's the real insight. They're programmable by a small piece, um, a small <laughs> as we call it, guide RNA, but um, the important thing to, to think is that you don't need a new protein. The same protein can be programmed to go to different locations in the genome and make those cuts that trigger the natural double-strand break repair pathways of DNA. And that's the key problem to solve. In that three billion base pair genome, how do you go to specific locations? How do you get pointers to gene A while not affecting gene B? And that's a lot of what my lab um, works on. So I think, um, you know, this is something that's really come online for scientists just in the last few years. But like anything in science, and I think especially for a public lecture, it's important for you to know that this is something that we as, as a society have actually invested in for a long time. And even though we've only been hearing about CRISPR in the New York Times probably in the last two or three years, CRISPR has a long history going back in biomedical research to 1987. And that's, um, the first place that, that CRISPR was really, it's got this, the, the reason I don't even define the acronym initially is that it's almost meaningless, clustered regularly interspace palindromic repeats. And this is a description of CRISPR really from its endogenous context. And this is, this is to me something that's, that's quite interesting, which is that in 1987, the first description of CRISPR, before people had any idea that it was this programmable scissors, was that it was something that was found in bacteria. And then for about 
uh, 20 years, um, the function of it in bacteria wasn't really well known. And so oftentimes you might hear in the discussion of funding basic research, you know, why do we spend time funding things like working on bugs or working on fruit flies, it, which won a Nobel Prize this year for, for medicine? Um, why is this useful? And this is, I think, a thing a lot of people don't appreciate about this programmable scissors is that it's actually an adaptive immune system in bacteria. That's where CRISPR actually comes from. Uh, CRISPR is not something we just invented in the lab. It's something we observed and saw in nature. And to me, that's mind-blowing, because if you think about it, um, we think of ourselves as very complicated. We have antibodies. Uh, we have T cells, B cells. We have this complicated immune system that keeps us healthy. But think about that. We're trillions of cells. A bacteria is one cell. It also has an adaptive immune system. Uh, this, this should blow your mind. I mean, for us, it's, it's, we, we know that we have an adaptive immune system, but a single-celled organism has a memory of the infections. Its natural uh, viruses are called bacteriophages. It has a memory of the bacteriophages that have previously infected it, and guess what? CRISPR is really the defense system um, that it uses to defend itself. And the people who figured this out, actually, in 2007, not, not too long ago, were actually yogurt scientists who were trying to figure out why their yogurt cultures sometimes get infected and just the milk never actually makes yogurt. They had sometimes some bioreactors, and they're doing this at an industrial scale, produced yogurt, but some didn't. And what they found is the ones that worked had this CRISPR system in them, same species of bacteria, um, one of the ones you find on the label of the yogurt canister. Um, but in the case of the ones that worked, they had an active CRISPR system. This is just such a translational piece of biology, a bunch of yogurt scientists, and now this thing is having a huge impact on human health. So let me tell you now about that impact on human health, or at least sample some of the applications. Okay, you can again notice the citation for this CRISPR everywhere picture that I took is from nature. That should tell you it's important. So, so CRISPR, in the few years that we've been developing this tool, and it's not just me, but it's a very large community of scientists, it's worth saying that, um, has had a really a large impact not just on human health, which is a lot of what I work on, but in many, many areas. And I've just highlighted a few here. One, food security. Uh, a few years ago, um, folks uh, developed a form of wheat that's resistant to something called powdery mildew. I didn't know very much about this, but it turns out um, if your wheat is infected with powdery mildew, that's a 40% reduction in yield, in yield from that wheat. Wheat is the most grown food crop all over the world. It is extremely important uh, to food security. Um, something a little bit maybe sillier is that now in our supermarkets you can find CRISPR engineered mushrooms that are where they've just removed a gene that, that is involved in the browning of those mushrooms. They stay um, fresh longer, these mushrooms. Uh, something closer to what I work on is this thing that's labeled cancer immunotherapy, the idea of engineering T cells so that they're more likely to attack a cancer that you might have and actually kill that, that cancer. Uh, we can talk more about some of that later if we're interested. And then um, there's been some work on what's known as gene drives, which we learn in, in high school that, you know, Gregor Mendel's experiments that the peas, they inherit one copy of their genes, you know, or we inherit one copy of our genes from mom, one copy from dad. With CRISPR, we can build genetic tools that actually force a gene to always be inherited in the offspring. And um, that's, that's a dangerous thing. That's something interesting we can, we can talk about later in the, in the discussion section. But some people are people like Bill Gates and other folks are thinking, how can we harness these tools to really wipe out malaria worldwide um, in places where people don't have access to amazing health care. And um, kind of even beyond CRISPR, I mean, this is, this is everything that's on this slide is the oldest citation here is 2014. This is really something that's happening now. And I, I want to say that it's not just CRISPR. It really is, I think, a renaissance happening in, in biology and in, in gene editing in general. So these are um, a, uh, something that, that I just saw this online two days ago and I thought I have, to, I have to talk about this. We really are living this year, especially in an age of gene therapy. The first time gene therapy, meaning inserting a gene into humans,
for some therapeutic purpose was tried in a research setting at the NIH was 1989. That's a, a little while ago, but only this year, only a few months ago, in October of 2017, was the first FDA-approved gene therapy uh, for a form of retinal blindness. Um, and since then, since October, if you can remember back two months ago, in the ensuing two months, there's been approvals for gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, um, a, a disease of neurons, and two forms of hemophilia, hemophilia A and B, that are due to deficiencies in, in clotting factors, factor eight and factor nine. So we, medicine is about to undergo, I think, a really a huge transformation. These are, I should just say that the things on this slide don't involve CRISPR, but they involve adding in genes uh, that are, in these folks, deficient, but in, in normal humans are, are found. And a lot of the controversy, because this is a medical ethics uh, uh, forum, I think a lot of the controversy here surrounds the idea of what kind of cells you edit. Um, this very uh, provocative, I think, uh, uh, cover article from the MIT Tech Review says we can now engineer you know, the, the human race. And what they're talking about there is germline editing, editing cells like sperm and egg that are passed on. And that's quite a serious thing that requires a lot of thought, I think. <laughs> Um, uh, before doing anything like that. The alternative, of course, is editing the cells that are not passed on, the blood cells, the brain cells, the things that only stay with the organism till the end of its life. And I think most of what you'll see and most of the efforts that scientists are pouring into today is, is doing this, is doing somatic editing to cure um, diseases that uh, really shorten lifespans um, and affect, uh, affect folks. And what's um, interesting, if you kind of Look at, uh, look at the opinions that are out there uh, today. Is this, this survey that was published in Nature Biotechnology a few months ago from about 1,600 adults in the United States. And um, folks seem to be largely in agreement that gene editing should be used for therapeutic purposes, but not for enhancement. That is not really um, something people see um, as, as, uh, as a need. And I, I told you about this distinction between germline editing and somatic editing. And one, one thing to consider is that I think there's a lot of um, very recently concern about germline editing, but it's really not, uh, I think, something that, that is in many ways necessary because we've become so good at reading DNA that when we do things like in vitro fertilization, which we've been doing now for almost 40 years, um, we have many ways to screen those embryos so that we can screen out genetic diseases. These are if anybody uh, in this audience, if you've had a baby in the last five years, you've almost certainly, unless you're very, very young, um, uh, unlike my wife and I, <laughs> you've almost certainly had um, a, one of these, one of these uh, uh, screening panels where they actually can just take some blood from mom and be able to, to screen uh, diseases of the, of the fetus. Amazing um, breakthrough, these non-invasive uh, genetic diagnoses. So, I've thrown a lot at you, but my, my goal was to give you a real feeling of what the technology, what the potential is, where we are, the answer is very, very early on, and what we can do. I haven't really told you too much about my research, so I'll just kind of end with one little, one little thing. I mentioned that, that CRISPR was very, very programmable, and one thing that's, that's difficult often is when we consider a disease like cancer or a, dis a disease, a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, where, where uh, a kid might not, you know, might be 16 and not able to speak. We want to know, when we see this patient in the clinic, what gene is responsible for what, what, what these folks have? And sometimes these diseases are very rare, and so we can't go out and collect, because as a scientist, what we want is we want to collect like a thousand patients, sequence all their DNA, figure out what gene it is that causes the disease. But that's, for any individual investigator, that can be very, very difficult. And what CRISPR lets us do is take, uh, one of the things that we do is take human cells in the lab, cells that we grow, and be able to test out different genetic hypotheses, to look at every gene in the genome, collect a data set that's impossible to collect just by um, getting patient samples and impossible to coordinate, and one by one, knock out every, say, knock out or manipulate every gene in the genome and test to see does it have something to do with this disease? And to be able to really narrow down, to take this giant space of three billion A's, T's, C's, and G's, and use this programmable CRISPR tool to find what are exactly the genes that are involved in specific 
um, specific diseases. And so I'm happy to talk more. That's kind of a high-level version of what we do. I'm happy to talk more. I was told to keep things brief. And I just want to um, thank the folks in my lab at the Genome Center and um, at NYU, just a little bit downtown of here, and also some collaborators um, from, from Boston, and of course the, the people who really um, generously fund, fund the work we do. So happy to talk more, take some questions. Okay, let's go. Let's be a little bit controversial. So we're gonna start off, first of all, I want everyone to know that uh, these have not been rehearsed. So these will be the first time that our panel is hearing these questions. So we'll have to give the five-second delay as they formulate answers. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Oh. This, this sounds like serious. Yes, it's serious. <laughs> um, and I just want to sort of give a, a, a biologic context. When we talk about CRISPR, we're going to be talking about three different things. One, to be able to use CRISPR in a tumor, for example. So change the nature of a tumor, inject it directly into a tumor so that it no longer continues to grow or metastasize. And that's been done in cervical cancer already this year. The second possibility or use of CRISPR is in cells that are in an adult or a non-embryo. So for example, to treat sickle cell anemia, we use CRISPR in some bone marrow cells and then subsequently all of the new blood cells will be made normal if successfully treated with the scissor. And the third is the embryo, or the, actually the sperm, or the egg, where if you use CRISPR to cure so-called disease that exists in the precursor to a human being for generations and generations later, that disease will disappear. So those are the three contexts that we need to be thinking about CRISPR. So I'm going to um, direct the first question to both Dr. Sanjana and Rabbi Bleich. To Dr. Sanjana first. Is CRISPR considered an interference with the divine order? Is it a case of man playing God? Yeah, I, I think it's reasonable to have concerns about any new technology. I think that's a really reasonable thing. And in fact, you can draw, there's a, there's a really nice analogy that I, I like to think of, which is um, the first time we had the ability to make recombinant DNA in the lab, as it's called, which is the ability in a test tube to be able to to cut and paste DNA. And this, this ability came about in the late 70s um, as a uh, biological technology. And there were some very serious concerns about it at the time. In fact, Cambridge, where, where I used to be living, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, um, they had a moratorium on the use of recombinant DNA for a while. It actually caused some researchers to actually leave uh, Harvard and MIT. Um, but it, in, you know, there were also a lot of great things that came from recombinant DNA technology. That was the first time we were actually able to make human proteins in, uh, in bacteria. And so I think one of the first ones that was made was insulin. So for folks that were not able to produce uh, insulin on their own, uh, when this uh, drug, this new kind of drug became available, the ability to, uh, to provide exogenous insulin, it was a game changer for folks um, that, that couldn't. And so, I, I think, I guess the, the short maybe answer would be that we have to be, I think, mindful, um, careful as we proceed with, with new technologies, but um, I think we also have to weigh the biomedical benefit it can give to us as a society. Rabbi Bleich, are we playing God if we use CRISPR? Please don't anybody walk out in the middle, because if you walk out in the middle, you may leave with the wrong impression. The question as phrased, I think presumes that we have no right to play God and we have no right to intervene in the natural order. So that if you're going to justify CRISPR or any other scientific breakthrough technology, you're going to have to somehow distinguish this from intervention, from playing God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let me begin by making a qualified statement. I believe it's true but it's true only as far as it goes, and the real trick will be in limiting it. And that if, if we dare use such anthropomorphic language, man not only has the right to, quote, play God, close quote, to interfere in the natural order, but has a divine mandate to do so. Question, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is the limitation. 
The, the seminal exposition I have always regarded to be the comments of the Beis Halevi on the verse in Chumash, Hisalech lefonai veheyesomim, the Rabbani Shlilam tells Avraham Avinu to walk before him and to be complete. It's a kind of an introduction or preamble to the commandment concerning circumcision. The Beis Halevi uh, takes one of the divine appellations, the name Shaddai, Shin Dalid Yud, which is understood in rabbinic, rabbinic literature as an acronym meaning Ani Shomarti Leilomi Dai. I was the one who said to my creation enough. And a very brilliant exposition. The Beis Halevi points out that the world in which we live and the world as it will appear in the eschatological era are quite, quite different. The world in which we live is a world of what I would term arrested development, or more precisely, arrested creation. Man was placed on earth. He was given the wherewithal to harness the uh, basic ingredients of creation and to use it for his own purposes. That requires a great deal of effort on the part of man and requires a good measure of ingenuity. A farmer plants a kernel of wheat, it germinates, a stalk grows, and other kernels of wheat grow as a result. The Beis Halevi points out that as far as the creator is concerned, the universe, the development of the universe, didn't have to stop at that stage. Uh, he doesn't give us the specific missing steps, but it's not hard to imagine them. The plant could grow, these uh, little uh, kernels could grow to the size of breadfruit, and I suppose a wind could come along and bang these breadfruits against one another and grind them to the point where they're pulverized and you have just flour, and then comes a torrential downpour, and you mix this powder called flour with water, and lo and behold, you have dough. At that point comes the sun, and the sun bakes it, and lo and behold, you have a loaf of bread. The Midrashic comment is that in the eschatological <laughs> era, the world will produce breadfruit, it will produce these gluskois, you will have baked cakes of one form or another, the same with regard to flax and garments, go through the same scenario, and man would have to do absolutely nothing. Man will be allowed to spend his time doing more rewarding things like studying Torah, etc. However, the Rabbani Shalom said, die, I am the one who said, Loi lomi die. I said enough, I did enough, and from now on, man must do the rest. Man must bring the process of creation to fruition. In effect, again, Kaviyokal, if one can use such language, man is co-opted by the Rabbani Shloilom to become his partner in Matzah Bereshis, becomes his partner in this act of creation. The goes with regard to man as well, and that's a specific application to the midst of circumcision. What this means is that the verse, Bezea Sapecho Techalechem, which sounds as if it's a curse, and it is a curse. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread, it is not simply a curse, but it also functions as if I use the Yeshivish jargon, it's a matir, it's a license, it's dispensation, it's permission. God has given us permission to enter his vineyard and to do all kinds of things in that vineyard in order to complete the process of creation. The real question is, is there a limit? And the answer is, I believe that there is a limit. Again, this is what in you know, legal language you would call a case of first impression. There is not an extensive rabbinic literature with regard to CRISPR at all and certainly not with regard to crossing the germ line, which is a different kettle of fish 
and presumably we'll talk about that later. The issue is, are there limits upon the authority given to man to become God's partner in my superatious? I believe that there are. But in order to explain why I believe there are, I think I'll have to digress just for a little bit. Uh, the, I've written an essay about whether there is natural law in Judaism. Natural law is simply the notion that there are a priori ethical moral concepts, that man is bound by them, man that know, man knows these imperatives, not only does he know how he should act, but he recognizes that he should be punished if he fails to act in that manner. Now, natural law has a very, very long history, and it comes in two flavors. It comes in plain vanilla, and it comes in chocolate. Plain vanilla is what I call the secular doctrine of natural ethics, beginning with the Roman Seneca, continuing down at least to John Locke, and I would argue that it's embedded in the United States Constitution, Declaration of Independence as well, even though it's there portrayed in a theistic manner. But it is a Lockean secular type of natural law. That's simply the notion that man, by the light of reason alone, knows that there are moral limitations. The second flavor, the chocolate flavor, is a theological doctrine of natural law which incorporates one additional principle, as I understand it, and that is that God has endowed everything in the universe with a certain telos, a certain end, a certain goal, and man ought not to tamper with the will of God. So assisted procreation for those natural law theologians becomes a violation of divine will, and man is supposed to recognize this again, by the light of reason alone. But man is recognizing that God has set certain boundaries, I would call them, but he has put certain purposes, ends, desiderata in the universe, and man should not try to circumvent them in any particular way. Insofar as Judaism is concerned, I do think that there are individual propositions that can only be described as natural law propositions. Only described as natural law propositions because they are not the product of dogmatic revelation. That's the difference. If you need a mitzvah to tell you that something is prohibited, you're dealing with dogma. If you need a commander, if you need God to command you, then you're talking about the Ratzon Hashem, divine will, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you do not need the deity to tell you that something is proscribed, then you must be able to self-regulate, to self-legislate, to know of your own accord that this is prohibited. I know of only one such normative principle that I can trace directly to Chazal, and that's the principle, my chosis de domedidoch sumokve mi domedachavroch. In context, it is a statement to the effect that I must suffer martyrdom rather than take the life of another human being. What is the authority? It's not a posuk, not an explicit verse, not a commandment. Svara, he says the Gemara. Translate svara any way you like. Call it legal logic, call it elementary. I think what it really means is natural law. Of course, the word is different but you can call the same thing by different names, but the substance is the same. Are there other such propositions of natural law? Not for today, it has nothing to do with anything that we're talking about. I think that there were individual Rishonim, medieval authorities, who recognized other principles of Jewish law. There's one principle of, I'm um, sorry, natural law. There's one principle of natural law which I never wrote about, never spoke about, because basically it is a negated principle of natural law, one which has been superseded by revelation, one which has been, in effect, eradicated by dogma. And I refer specifically to this principle, Varapo Yerape, translated usually in English, and heal, he shall surely heal. In terms of Talmudic exegesis, 
The Gemara says, Mikan shenit l'rishus l'roife l'rapis. From here is derived the principle that the physician has authority to heal. The word rishus in that sentence does not mean discretion. It doesn't mean that he may, if he chooses, heal. If he chooses not to heal, not to heal. The Ramban says very clearly, Hai rishus de mitzvahi. When this dispensation has been given man, it becomes a mitzvah, it becomes commanded, and it is now all part of the general obligation of pikuach nefesh, etc., etc. The license to interfere in the natural order in order to practice the healing arts is a divine mandate. It's not only permission, it's not discretionary, the authority becomes mitzvahidic, if I can coin a phrase, it becomes mandatory. Question, and why do we need this verse in the first place? Why do I need rishus l'rape l'rapeis? So we have Rishonim, we have Rashi, Tesis, Ramban. They say the same thing, but they say it in different words. The first formulation is, and who gave the physician the right to intervene in natural processes? Who gave him the colossal nerve to do these things? Rachmona mache viu mase. The affliction comes from God, and now a human physician has the audacity to intervene, to try to reverse the divine decree. Of course, it would be prohibited. Therefore, God himself has to give dispensation. Or a second formulation, the doctor, when he intervenes medically, is a nire kaseser gzera samelech. It appears as if he is thwarting the decree of the divine king. Note the word nire. It appears. He is not thwarting the decree of the divine king. But to the onlooker who knows no better, it may appear that he is doing so. The phrase, the posuk, mikan shenitna rishus l'reife l'rapais, is a second matir. It renders permissible and hence imperative the practice of medicine. Why do I need this license? Why don't I know this anyway? Because otherwise I would have no right to intervene in the natural order. Given this right, man is not only co-opted in the act of creation to bring creation to completion, but also to co is co-opted by the rabbinic Shalom in the exercise of divine providence. And that's why the doctor is only near it. He has the appearance of intervening in the natural order. He isn't really because this too is part of the divine plan. All of this is part of divine providence. Now, having said that, does this mean that everything is permissible? It does not mean that everything is permissible. How do I know that it doesn't mean everything is permissible? For this, I need an argumentum ad vericudium. I have to appeal to some authority. Not that I necessarily agree with the limitation that I'm going to talk about. The limitation is, and what may the doctor do? There is a very interesting, only academically so, not in practice, because everybody knows the answer. The academic question is that if a doctor tells a patient the day before Yom Kippur, you need a certain number of calories over this 24-hour period, you need a certain quantity of liquid over this 24-hour period, drink so much liquid, and eat so many slices of bread. Why shouldn't the patient have an obligation to hook himself up to an IV and get <coughs> glucose solution? He'll get calories, he'll get hydration, and he won't have to eat or drink a Yom Kippur. There is no prohibition on Yom Kippur in taking food other than by mouth. This is a question which is addressed by at least half a dozen rabbinic authorities. The late Rabbi Moshe Feinstein Sochran Lavrocha, in a tshuva published in Igris Moshe, had a very simple answer to the question. His answer to the question is 
that the Rabbani Shalom gives Rishus Varefe Varapes. The doctor has permission to heal. And how are you supposed to heal? By utilizing the dark Hirafua, using the things that doctors use to cure. Whatever he has in his black bag, that's called medicine. If he's doing something just to feed you and using medicines to feed you, when ordinary bread and water will suffice, this isn't therapeutic, this isn't the way medicine is supposed to work. Medicine is supposed to be used for other things. He understands as limiting the things that a person can do under this general rubric of medicine. What is the derech harufu is fine, what is not the derech harufu is not fine, and I'm very happy, if, though I'm not at all certain that it's applicable in terms of eating on Yom Kippur, there are other ways to explain why it's necessar not necessary to use an IV on Yom Kippur, but it does serve as a response to people who would like to practice homeopathic medicine. Uh, God gave permission to doctors to practice medicine, things that medicine recognizes, what medicine doesn't recognize, they be off balance. For my purposes, I think that it illustrates something else. I'm not so much concerned about the means that are being employed to achieve a certain end. I am concerned with the end. I understand this Rishus as granting license, dispensation, and even a mandate a positive obligation to intervene in order to remedy things that have gone wrong physiologically, which is simply a, a colloquial way of saying that there is a norm and there are things that are not part of the normal. When something is recognized as not being a normal physiological state, the physician has every right and every obligation to intervene in order to restore a state of homostasis, to restore the norm, to restore the state of nature, if you like. However, I understand Mikan Shinitna Rishus Lorefilarapis as being, shall I call it the antidote, or the counterweight to what is otherwise a principle of natural law, namely, thou shalt not thwart the divine decree. You have license to thwart the divine decree so long as it is the practice of medicine. You do not have the power or the license to thwart the divine decree when what you're trying to achieve is not the normal culmination of the process of creation. Planting wheat and baking bread is bringing to culmination the process of creation. Creating a human being who is seven feet six inches tall so that he is an excellent basketball player, this is not part of the divine template for man. So it seems to me that it is the purpose for which these procedures, whatever they may be, are to be used that is the governing principle. Man has the right to play God. He does have that right. He has the right to play God in exercising, in being a partner with God, in exercising divine hashkoche, in exercising providence, in bringing creation to completion, but not in an attempt to improve upon the natural order, certainly insofar as the human condition is concerned. So that if one is talking about CRISPR or genetic, mutation, genetic manipulation of one kind or another, which is designed to eliminate disease, I think the principle in Judaism would be brothel. If you are talking about doing things beyond that, I would say that it is a violation of halacha. And if you ask me which one of the 613 principles, 613 mitzvahs, I would answer it's near a zerah which is not the product of the dogmatic revelation, but it's a kind of natural law proposition which has survived despite the license of Harappa Yerape, but has survived in this very narrow sense.
Thank you. We'll come back to that last point. Dr. Sanjana, uh, I just want to reflect on one of your slides where you talk about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in vitro fertilization. There are many guidelines that help us from the secular ethics perspective of how to proceed with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and in vitro fertilization. What is the comparison in terms of CRISPR? These ethical issues have been sort of uh, develop very sophisticated for those issues. Where are we in secular ethics with the use of CRISPR? Okay, so f first uh, disclosure: I'm, I'm a scientist, not an ethicist. So this is this is going to have, uh, I think, limited uh, ability to to move forward. But um, I mean, just as I see it, the reason I, I presented that slide about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is I think a, lo a lot of folks might not be familiar with what's already uh, kind of the current state of the art that that is there. Um, and that doesn't require any gene editing or gene manipulation. That's just um, what happens at the clinic in terms of screening embryos that would have some genetic defect versus ones that don't. And I think um, because you hear about, you know, will CRISPR be used to modify the germline, I think it's important to realize that we already have pretty good ways to, to I don't want to say modify the germline, but kind of sort the germline, figure out which uh, germline embryos we choose to have go, um, go come to fruition to a human being. And so um, that, that, that was the purpose of me uh, presenting that. And I think I agree from, what I, from that, the last portion of what, what was said by, by the rabbi. I think that's a really nice set of guidelines to actually say you know, how we're going to use this technology. OK. Uh, both you and I mentioned using CRISPR technology for cancer. Can you give, since for the audience, we're all afraid of cancer. We all are looking for treatments of cancer. Uh, how is CRISPR going to be helpful? So I can, I can tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing over the last few years. And this is, I mean, it's hard to fully capture how many different scientists have been using CRISPR in really cool, creative ways uh, with, with cancer. But I can tell you about what, what we did, actually, is so I, I kind of hinted at the idea that because this, this CRISPR, this scissors, is so programmable, um, we can actually not just target one gene in the genome, but we can actually build libraries of these CRISPR scissors that we can manipulate really any gene in the genome or all genes in the genome. And so uh, one of the first problems we decided to tackle with this technology is um, in uh, late 2011, the FDA approved a kind of next generation chemotherapy for melanoma. It's a targeted therapy that actually targets the most commonly mutated gene in melanoma. It's called BRAF, the name of the gene. It doesn't matter what the name is. But um, what unfortunately is, was found um, with folks that get on these BRAF inhibitors is that um, you know, they might have very serious metastatic melanoma, meaning they have many lesions all over their body. It's very late stage melanoma. It's not a, not a good disease to have, not a good stage. And uh, they take this drug, um, which is genetically targeted to this uh, particular mutation, this BRAF mutation. Um, and it does not affect their normal cells, which is a very huge difference between a genetically targeted drug and a normal chemotherapy, which kind of just inhibits all dividing cells. Um, and what, what was found is that the patients get better for several weeks. They, they all the, the, the tumors kind of melt away, but in almost all cases, the cancer is kind of outsmarts the drug. It evolves resistance to the drug and finds a way to keep growing. Just some small, all you need is a few cells that figure out a way around this drug, and then you've, got, you've just basically selected through, um, in a sense, natural selection for resistant cancer cells. And this, this happens for many chemotherapies. This is why you see uh, uh, this kind of remission and then the, the cancer comes back. This is, this is not a new phenomenon. So when, what we did about now three years ago is we used this, in, as I said, it was very hard to collect a large enough group of cancer patients maybe to figure out what are all mutations that lead to resistance to this drug, which is called vemurafenib. So what we did is we took human melanoma cells, just in um, cells that we could use in the lab. Um, this is taken from a cancer patient. These grow well in, 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 in a dish in the lab. And instead of looking at one gene or having some hypothesis about what gene might trigger resistance to vemurafenib, we used the CRISPR system to knock out every single gene in the human genome and comprehensively found out what are all genes that when you lose their function, when you have a mutation that removes the function of that gene, 
might trigger resistance to vemurafenib. Okay, so, okay, that's some nice basic science. We got a list of genes. We recovered all known mechanisms of vemurafenib resistance plus a few others. And what good is that? Okay, the drug is kind of a failure, right? It, it really, in mo almost all patients, they evolve resistance. So just like uh, the analogy I, th I, I keep in my mind is, is what happened with HIV about 20 years ago. There, there are many single drugs that were tried and um, HIV is a very mutagenic virus. It evolved resistance to many of these single therapies. But now, actually, folks with HIV have a pretty uh, normal life because we have this cocktail of three drugs that, when put together, um, keep, keep the virus at bay, keep it under control. Um, and so I think with cancer, we're heading toward a si maybe a similar model where um, it's not just going to be vemurafenib, not just one drug, but really maybe what you need is to find the right cocktail that melanoma is not going to be able to evolve around. This is just, uh, I'm putting out to you as, as a hypothesis, but a lot of folks in the field of, of cancer feel that we've been taking a very simplistic approach. We're like, okay, we, you, know, you have this type of cancer, you have this mutation, we give you this drug, um, but that maybe with cancer we need something a little more sophisticated. And again, HIV was a tremendous investment. In the 80s, it became clear to some, some folks that we should pour money uh, into the study of, of, H, of uh, the virus itself, which we actually use now for all sorts of amazing things in science. The uh, HIV is used for all, lentivirus is used for many things. But um, I think we're seeing something similar with, with, with cancer, and that's just one angle. We could talk about cancer immunotherapy, which I hinted at a little bit there, but I just want to tell you something that's happening in our lab with melanoma, with vemurafenib, um, to be able to get that comprehensive list, at least we can start thinking about strategies to make this kind of combination therapy. We're not there yet, but we're thinking now. We know what the targets are to go after. Okay, thank you. So the utilization of CRISPR can be done on somatic cells, adult kind of cells, and germ cells, sperm, et cetera. Uh, Rabbi Bleich, this is to you. So we are all well acquainted that participation in human subject research requires consent. And the individual needs to be able to give a free mind, free body consent to do this. But CRISPR can be used in the germline that affects generations ahead. Is it ethically appropriate to do research in this area even though we can't obtain informed consent from generations later? The late Professor Paul Ramsey, who was a Protestant ethicist and theologian, developed the thesis that all fetal experimentation is by definition immoral because, as you put it a moment ago, you cannot get consent from the uh, fetus to perform experiments. There is no telling in advance how the experiment is going to play itself out and that you are running the risk of imposing a burden upon an, an as yet unborn life. Uh, I can report that he was delighted when I told him that I have a Talmudic precedent for his position. The Talmudic precedent is what is probably the oldest piece of eugenic legislation known to man. And that is the statement of the Gemara genetic counseling advice. Don't marry a woman who hails from a family in which there is epilepsy or in which there is tsaras, it is not leprosy, I'm sorry, the epilepsy, tsaras is not leprosy, whatever it is. The, uh, the statement clearly assumes that what we're dealing with is a genetically transmitted disease. It's something which is hereditary. Whether this is an actual prohibition or not, I won't discuss now. I think there's a conflict with regard to that. De minimus, it is certainly sage, moral, ethical advice. It says that you should not impose burdens on unknown lives unless you're absolutely certain that you're not going to do so, you should refrain from trying to manipulate, to tamper in any way possible. Now, even if it is a piece of rabbinic legislation, it's clearly limited in its scope. To say that it's limited in its scope doesn't mean that you're operating with moral freedom. Uh, it seems to me to be correct to say 
that the experimentation, if it involves the unborn, is by definition immoral from the vantage point of Judaism, which means that there are limitations upon the license that is given to a physician, limitation upon the license which is given to a scientist. The, uh, the limitation is that one should not contribute insofar as humanly possible from creating, I'm sorry, one should not uh, contribute to creating additional human misery. There is enough in the natural order without man intervening in the natural order in manner that can result in something of that untoward nature. So the answer, you know, the short answer is that uh, there's you know, a principle, primum non nocera, first do no harm. And this type of experimentation has the potential for harm unless it's proven differently. Now, having said that, one also has to add that Jewish, Judaism and Jewish law does not have a Miranda principle. It doesn't have an inherent bias against reaping benefit from experimentation, which is inherently immoral. That presents problems in and of itself. That's more and goes beyond today's discussion. But the fact that there is a limitation upon what can be done in terms of legitimate science from the ethical perspective doesn't impair use of the results of things which in and of themselves may very well have been immoral. The second point that I should make, and that is that as of now, time we are speaking, the only, uh, the only fetal experimentation that I'm aware of dealing with crossing the germ line is in Great Britain as since 19, February of 1916. I'm sure things have happened I don't know about, but this is the most recent information that I have. It involves uh, experimentation upon a fetus with the proviso that the fetus is destroyed after a period of seven days. Now clearly this type of experimentation uh, forget for the moment about having the experiment go wrong and you have a neonate who is born with physical or other congenital defects, you have something which involves uh, the destruction of a fetus. Feticide, which in Judaism for mainstream authorities is just another form of homicide and for others is pro prohibited on other grounds. And science, in quotation marks, places this limitation, demands the destruction of the fetus because it is concerned precisely with all the things I spoke about earlier. But uh, I'm not sure whether this isn't just jumping from the fire pan into the fire. In fact, I'm sure it is. The remedy, destroying the fetus, is even worse than the problem that was created in the first place. So that I fail to see how this type of experimentation could be sanctioned by Judaism. Okay, we'll get back to this experimentation soon. Um, Dr. Sanjana, CRISPR today in your lab is fantastically expensive. In the perspective of to do it the right way, you have to have all these NIH grants, foundation grants, Simon grants, all that sort of stuff. Do you think that CRISPR as a technology for human therapy is going to be priced out of the market? Will it only be for rich people? Will the FDA approve such a thing? Will insurance companies cover it? What are we talking about? Amazing miracles for the rich and none for the poor? Or how is this going to work out? OK, so I don't, just first off, I don't have a real answer to that question. But I think it's a great question. It's a question that's really worth thinking about deeply. Um, so yeah, especially as these new gene therapies are approved. And I'm not just going to refer to CRISPR, but really any gene replacement therapy, because this is a new thing for a drug company. It's really a one-shot, um, hopefully lifelong cure when, when they give this. And so the question is what, is, you know, what is a reasonable cost? If somebody has hemophilia, if somebody has sickle cell disease, they're going to be coming into the hospital 10 times a year uh, normally and, of course, have a lifespan that ends at 30 or 40 years um, for, with some of these diseases like, like sickle cell. Um, and so uh, I, I don't have really an answer of what the cost should be. I, I can tell you some historical examples which are kind of, I think, hopefully um, educational for, these, for the drug companies too, which is um, not in the US, but in Europe, the first gene therapy was approved a couple years earlier in, in 2012. Um, 
I'm trying to remember the name. I think the company's name is Unicure. Um, and it's, uh, I'm blanking even on what, what the gene therapy was, was for, but it's some inborn uh, genetic <coughs> disorder. And I think before the company either closed down or gave up on selling the gene therapy, which happened two years ago, uh, one patient was treated with it. And, and one of the reasons that only one patient was treated with this gene therapy, which it took a lot of money to get it to market, to get it through the approval agencies that um, that needed to be done, the European FDA. Um, I think uh, the, the cost was, I don't remember exactly, but somewhere between half a million and one million dollars, and that's, I mean, who is gonna pay for that, right? So that's, I, I think that's one real challenge with these, these therapies. What I'm hoping is it's just like with any new thing, you know, you produce the first computer in the world and it, it's you know, going to be $10 million or something, I, I don't know. Um, but that as this technology becomes more widespread, as more people are able to practice it, as it's developed for more diseases, that the prices really fall in line. But I think in general, prices in healthcare are a huge area that um, requires, I think, smart minds, smart people. So this is you know, the undergraduate, I guess, medical ethics society. So I think when you guys are thinking um, of you know, how medicine interfaces with other disciplines, I think this is really something that is truly a problem of this time. How do we make, as healthcare takes over the economy, how do we make it more and more affordable for more and more people? Um, I think that's an important, very New York City question. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi Bly. Uh, uh, different yes, question. Yes, I want to go back. I'll, I'll, this. <laughs> uh, I'll be delighted to answer the question when it becomes real. Uh, right now, it's not a real question. But the answer is very short and very succinct. He who gives life gives sustenance. The problem that we have is how to harness our resources to channel them where they should go. The healthcare crisis, the economic crisis in healthcare is a real one only because we allow it to be a crisis. Uh, that goes, I think, beyond what we want to talk about this morning. It's allocation of resources, not whether we have the resources. The question is, what are our values? What are our priorities? Are we going to save lives or are we going to spend money on highway beautification? It's all a matter of triage. You establish your priorities and act accordingly. Okay, no politics. Uh, <laughs> so, you mentioned the issue of uh, using embryos, and this becomes a real issue. So when couples go for fertility treatment, multiple embryos are generated, these embryos are frozen, potentially for use later to create new human beings. If a couple has done this and they have frozen their embryos, are they able to give permission to use that for research for CRISPR, to use those uh, embryos for research per se. The issue there is the simple issue of destroying the fertilized ovum. The, there is some disagreement. It is my firm opinion that human life begins with conception and that there's a prohibition of feticide, the distinction between the first 40 days and subsequent periods of gestation is, relatively speaking, an artificial one, one which does not, by any means, have mainstream support in rabbinic literature. Once you have a recognizable zygote, it becomes extremely difficult for me to, to see any grounds upon which the fetus could be destroyed. Donation to medical science is, in effect, consignment to death insofar as the fetus is concerned which means then that the surplus ova uh, could not be used for scientific research if the scientific research, and it's almost by definition that it is, if the scientific research is going to result in destruction of this developing embryo. Okay, one last question to Robert Bleich. Uh, you talked about creating the basketball player. So it's clear that CRISPR technology could be used to make people with blue eyes or blonde hair or high IQ or a good uh, three-point shot. Is this something that is ethically appropriate as opposed to curing disease? As in all cases, you can draw a continuum from zero to 10. Zero is clear, 10 is clear. I spoke before about the norm and deviation from the norm. Basically, the problem here is defining the norm. 
What is a, quote, improvement, close quote, upon the norm, I think falls within the type of activity that I don't think is legitimate. If you're talking about a remedy, I think that it's more than legitimate. Now the question is, what is the norm? If you take your example of the color of the eye, red, green, brown, aquamarine, I don't know what, it seems to me that all of those are well within the, uh, the spectrum of what is considered normal for a human being. If you will talk about a rare ophthalmological disease that leaves someone with a red eye, literally, and this is a source of embarrassment, et cetera, et cetera, I think that there are grounds in halakha to describe the embarrassment that the individual would suffer if, if suffering from such a uh, abnormality. Uh, would be classified as a, a malady of one kind or another, which warrants intervention. So it all depends what it is we're talking about. When you use the term designer baby, I think it captures precisely what I refer to when I talk about enhancement. If this is for purposes of enhancement, I don't think it's acceptable. If it's for purposes of restoring health, of allowing an individual to uh, become part of what is considered the norm, then I think it's absolutely sanctionable. To use somewhat different terminology, and this comes from not a particularly authoritative responsum, but one dealing with cosmetic surgery and the propriety. Cosmetic surgery designed to eliminate a mum, uh, blemish, and we have technical definitions of a blemish. In this authority's uh, opinion, if it was there to rectify what is halachically classified as a mum, a blemish disqualifying a coin from performing the avoida or what have you, then this is by definition a malady and is permissible. Uh, the problem is defining what is, quote, a mum, what is a deviation from the norm. And what is not a deviation from the norm, but what is an enhancement in order to create a better norm or a better status quo? I think that in theory, the distinction is very clear. In, in the real world, there may be cases in which you would have to think long and, and hard in order to make a determination. OK, I want to thank both of our panelists, Dr. Sanjana, Dr. Roy. Good afternoon. My name is Adira Kopel, and I am the Vice President of the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our next panel of esteemed speakers, Rabbi Ozer Glickman and Dr. Matthew Liao, who will be having a conversation discussing the ethics of neurotechnologies. Rabbi Glickman is a Rosh Yeshiva of Ritz, where he received his rabbinic ordination. He holds a BA in philosophy from Columbia University, um, and an MBA in finance from NYU Stern School of Business. Rabbi Glickman also pursued graduate studies in philosophy and religion at the University of Toronto. As a practicing data scientist on Wall Street, Rabbi Glickman will provide a unique angle on the, big, on the ethics of big data and artificial intelligence. Dr. Matthew Liao is an expert in bioethics and holds a PhD from Oxford University and a BA from Princeton University. He has authored several books and articles and has been featured in many well-known media outlets such as the New York Times, the BBC, and many others. Dr. Liao holds the Arthur Zittrain Chair of Bioethics and is the director of the Center for Bioethics and is an affiliated professor in the Department of Philosophy at New York University. The conversation you are about to hear will discuss the rising issue of digital and biological integration. So now, please join me in welcoming Rabbi Ozer Glickman and Dr. Matthew Liao. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have to observe that uh, at the uh, last meeting of the Russia Yeshiva, uh, my Rebbe, Rabbi Tenler, came in and he said, how are you, young man? Then I listened to the first session about the plenary session about aging and discovered that that's an inapt description. I'm <laughs> actually much older than I thought I was. I'm so pleased to participate in an event that honors my Rebbe, Rav Moshe David Tendler Shlita, who set in motion the process that brought me to Yeshiva University over 20 years ago. Yeah, it's that long. Yeah. 
<laughs> Rav Tendler's courage for the sake of Torah, whose stamp is itself truth, has defined his lustrous career. Through the grace of God, we'll have his counsel and leadership for many years to come. Thank you, Rebbe. This is a teaching moment, and I will uh, embrace it to introduce our session with the incomparable Dr. Matthew Lau. You should have wondered when you saw the advertisement why one name was listed as just rabbi among all these distinguished medical doctors and academics. I have been in the medical field for over 60 years. I've been a patient. <laughs> Although I've done graduate work in philosophy, Dr. Lau is the philosopher in the discussion, and of course on a most important level, we're all philosophers, but you know what I mean. And I'm not a proponent of the Das Toh review that mastery of halachic dialect confers expertise in every sector of life. So what am I doing sitting up here? I'm really here in another role this morning. In my mercantile life, I work actively in data science. I'm a member of the senior advisory board of Oliver Wyman, a global management consulting firm. I've led a team of engineers using artificial intelligence to model the preferences of investors in the global equity markets. I'm starting another project tomorrow that will turn the decision making of a group of highly experienced portfolio managers investing in credit risky companies into an expert system. There's a virtuous circle which we heard in an earlier presentation in the application of technology. It may start with academics. Some of them may be neuroscientists, biologists, and physicians. Where the testing and refinement comes in is where the models succeed and fail is with the rich data sets and the incredibly powerful technology applied by corporations, advisors, and practitioners. A prominent radiologist described to me yesterday on the way home from shul how IBM is revolutionizing the way doctors will read film in the years ahead. In fact, they probably won't at all as everything is digitized and neural networks process far more data than the human version could ever hope to do. So armed with the vocabulary of a graduate student in philosophy and the sensibilities of a rabbi, this data analyst and model builder is here to pose questions to a leading figure in what is for me one of the most fascinating fields today, the intersection of neuroscience and moral philosophy. Thank you to my brilliant student, Gabriel Sturm, and the wonderful Stern women I've encountered in preparing for this session, uh, especially Sarah Wiener. And so I'll begin with a few questions of my own and then we'll segue into the thought experiments created by our students. Okay. So Dr. Lau, a few of us on Wall Street, and we talked a little bit about Kathy O'Neill, who's going to appear in a volume that you're editing, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, are somewhat discomfited by the rise of big data. Data mining is for us a pejorative term. As Kathy has argued persuasively in her bestseller, Weapons of Math Destruction, the models that drive so much of our world today can increase inequality by submerging the idiosyncratic in the statistical mean of expected behavior. The epistemology upon which these models are built, that everything we need to know is in the data itself, has never been adequately grounded in philosophy. It seems to me to be simply another version of the problem of induction. Are there dangers in the application of neuroscience in the very idiosyncratic world that's made up of individuals? None of us is statistical distribution. We're all a population unto ourselves. I'm thinking of some of the issues raised in the neuropsychiatry of moral cognition and social conduct in chapter nine of moral brains which should be, by the way, there it is, it should be in everyone's library. I've done my part to boost the Amazon ranking as I own both the paperback and Kindle editions. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Stated more simply, 
do we lose the individual in the submersion of the particular into the aggregate? At what point does neuroscience stop being descriptive and start being proscriptive? Does that raise warning flags? Oh, so first of all, I just want to uh, uh, thank uh, Gabrielle Sturm for inviting me to be here. It's a great honor to be here and to be here in a conversation with Rabbi uh, Glickman. Uh, so to your question, I think that big data ethics, that's sort of one of the biggest topics that's coming up now. So today, I think just coming here, I was reading that um, apparently uh, Amazon wants to put Alexa. So Alexa is this sort of uh, this device where you can kind of speak to it and um, you can order, you know, you can sort of tell it to turn on lights and sort of turn on music, et cetera, et cetera. And it's got to be on all the time and people are, uh, you know, Getting them in their homes. I actually just bought one for my grandmother because uh, so that I, you know I can you can just literally drop in and sort of she'll show uh, and then she'll be able to talk to me uh, uh, on the phone. Like she won't even have to pick up. There'll be a little screen. So Amazon is actually going to try to push Alexa into classrooms now. Um, and one of the dangers of Alexa is just uh, it just comes up. It's the issue of privacy. So Alexa basically is on all the time. It is listening when, when you place it in the home, in the classroom, it's listening all the time. And it's processing, and so that it's ready. When you say, Alexa, you know, turn on the light, it's ready to sort of respond to your commands um, and so on. Um, but there are big issues because it's uh, sort of, it's recording everything you're saying. Um, and it's uh, so that it can process, right? And it gets better when there are a lot of people who are using it. Uh, just kind of like uh, uh, the GPS on your phones, right? It works better. It works really well in New York because everybody has a mobile phone and it tracks the data in your movement. So I was in uh, Mexico uh, sort of last year and it didn't work so well because people actually didn't use the GPS so much. So it needs data. All these technologies need data and it's personal data. And some of it is innocuous, but it raises questions such as, I mean, just to give you a very concrete example. So, um, there was a murder scene, uh, sort of, uh, I think maybe about six months ago, and now they're wondering whether they can compel Amazon to reveal Alexa. There was an Alexa uh, in that home. And so now can Alexa be used to testify against you, right? So those are issues that we're going to, uh, these new technologies, I, I'm a sort of uh, uh, techno, enthu uh, like I'm very enthusiastic about technology, but at the same time, they raise a lot of ethical issues that we need to be uh, thinking about. And so, um, so that's sort of how I would uh, begin to um, um, think about some of these issues. Another thing about sort of, uh, I'll just mention one other thing because uh, you mentioned the work of, of uh, Kathy O'Neill. So it turns out that data is not innocuous. So uh, a lot of uh, um, policing, for example, now, they're using a lot of, they're, they're using something called autom uh, autom uh, automatic suspicion uh, uh, algorithms for, uh, and this is sort of to use to sort of, for sentencing purposes, to determine sort of whether someone should uh, uh, get parole. But the problem is uh, uh, with uh, sort of these uh, sort of these algorithms is that it's basically garbage in, garbage out, and so it turns out that uh, when you feed data into this information, it it, use, it uses sort of the background of the person, the race of the person, uh, the location, et cetera, et cetera, and that could have a bi very biasing effects. So it turns out that say African Americans turn out to get, they don't get on parole because of the suspicion algorithm. And that's a big problem because it's not, and, and, and judges are sort of using these as sort of decision, you know, like to help them with their decisions. And so that could become another sort of problem. So. I would say who gets a mortgage today, by the way? Yeah. It's based on who gets credit cards. Uh, the, the thing that made me worry about is if I had Alexa and I haven't gotten it, because if Amazon were listening into the conversation at home, then they might pre-order books on marriage counseling, and I um, would rather not have that known. Okay. 
Um, our session leaders and I spent a lot of time on Professor Joshua Green's discussion of consequentialism versus deontology in moral arguments. For those not familiar with the vocabulary, would you briefly define them and expand a little bit on their, their importance? Sure. So consequentialism and deontology, they're two of the major moral theories, uh, sort of non-secular uh, moral theories. And so consequentialism basically says that you should try to do that act that'll produce the best outcome, right? And in sort of stated like that, that doesn't seem too controversial, right? Uh, we should you know, make sure that the act has good outcomes. Um, but it runs into a lot of problems. So, um, so for example, you know, if you're uh, um, your doctor, I know that there are many physicians in the room. So, you know, you're, there's a healthy patient who just came into the, the the room, but you got five patients in the next room who need sort of organs of different sorts, right? And so, if you're a consequentialist, you might think, well. Here are five people I can save, and here's one person. Maybe I can just, you know, uh, take the organs, you know, of this person and put it into these five people. So that would seem to produce the best outcome. But that's what sort of that's sort of a, a, a problem with uh, consequentialism. Um, but of course, there are more sophisticated versions of consequentialism. So they'll, uh, you know, consequentialists will say, well. That's true, so maybe we should, you know, imagine if you'd done it secretly, if nobody found out about it, right? Then would that be okay, right? Or another version is, uh, well, that's why we have some sort of low-level rules to prevent people from do, doing that. But really, you know, in extreme situations, it should be okay to sort of kill one to say five. And so then you have the deontological theory. So the, the main uh, arguments against uh, sort of, you have the other moral theory, sort of deontology basically saying that consequentialism uh, matters, but they're not the only thing that matters, right? There are other things, things like rights, uh, an agent's intention, um, and fairness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that, that's also relevant. And so a way to figure out, um, so it turns, so this debate has been going on for a long time. And some of you might be familiar with something called the trolley problems. Okay, so the trolley problems is sort of imagine that <clears throat> the trolley's going, you know, there's a trolley, it's a runaway trolley, it's about to go down a track and hit five people. Um, it's gonna kill them. But then you can, there's a lever and you can switch the lever and it'll go onto the side track killing the one. So is it okay to do that? How many people think it's okay to switch the lever? Okay, so a few people. Um, then, uh, so there, I, I, it turns out that people have done this survey. So Josh Green's done a survey like this where there are over 300,000 people around the world from different cultures uh, have answered variations of this problem. It turns out that many, most people think that that's okay that it's okay to do it because, and one reason might be something like, because uh, you don't really intend to kill the person on the side track, you're just trying to save the five people, et cetera, et cetera. But now imagine a variation of that case. So imagine that there's uh, sort of, you're standing over a footbridge, right? And there's someone who's really big, and you can just push that person, so the trolley's, again, is going towards the five people. And you can push this person with a heavy backpack, let's say, and then the person will fall in front of the track, and then the, tr the trolley will hit the person, it will stop saving the five. So how many people think it's okay to push the person? Yeah, so m m like, like, much fewer, like fewer people think that it's okay to do that. But it's really interesting because in both cases, it's five versus one. So if you're a consequentialist, you're gonna think, um, well, look, it just, you know, it's five versus, what's the difference here, right? And so the consequentialist, uh, the deontology, uh, is, you know, has different theories about why that's okay. So in, in, the, in the, the pushing case, the deontologist is gonna say something like, well, one explanation they've given is something like, well, you're using the person as a means to saving the five. Notice that in the first case, when you switch on to the sidetrack, you don't need to use the person. If that person weren't there, you would have saved the five. But in the, uh, in the second case, you can't uh, save the five unless you use that person's body, right? So some people think that, you know, that's problematic. 
But what's really interesting about Josh Green's work is, so anyways, this debate, and there are many iterations of the trolley problem. But what's really interesting about Josh Green's work is that he wants to say that, uh, so he's a consequentialist, and he wants to say that actually looking at uh, our moral brains can settle, can help us settle this intractable debate. And how does he say that? So the way he, so he got a bunch of people, uh, sort of, uh, uh, he put a bunch of subjects under fMRI, functional magnetic, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and he asked questions that I just asked you, right? And then he found out, um, and so um, he, then he sort of, uh, sort of used fMRI to look at what, what happens to the brain when people are thinking about these moral problems. And he found out that when people are thinking deontologically, the amygdala region of the brain tends to light up. That's the sort of the emotional center. They have this uh, gut reaction, yuck, you know, sort of bad, you know, uh, reaction to it. But when people think, there are some people, there are about 17% of the people who think it's okay to push the person, okay? About 17 of them, the more utilitarian ones. The, the prefrontal cortex region of the brain tends to light up. And the prefrontal region of the brain is the more evolutionary, more advanced region of our brain. It's where all your cognition, you know, sort of uh, your high level uh, thinking uh, takes place. And so on the basis that Green makes this argument that, well, this actually shows that consequentialism is correct because, uh, you, know, we, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, people on the uh, sort of, if it's because of our evolutionary past that we sort of think that there's something to deontology. But if you think more rationally, then you should be a consequentialist. So, hmm. so th let me understand yeah. then. Yeah. If I'm a consequentialist, I, I'm not looking for morality based on rules. I'm looking for morality based on the consequences of, that could be changing in every situation. So how does a society function then? Yeah, so that's, that version of consequentialism is called act consequentialism. So it turns out that it sounds really demanding uh, that you got to be thinking about, is this act, you know, am I producing the best consequence right now? So, you know, one of the things that consequentialists say is, you know, what they're giving is a theory of rightness rather than the dis decision procedure. And so for decision, so they draw this distinction. Uh, and they then say something like, well, uh, in practical decisions, maybe we need to use heuristics, et cetera, et cetera. But the rightness, what makes it right is that the act produces the best consequences. So, hmm. yeah. so I can understand that as a moral argument, yeah. but I, I don't understand what the evidence of the brain scan adds to that discussion. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's a really good question. So uh, the, uh, think of, the brain scan, so, you know, sort of what's the significance of the brain scan and how can it settle, like, that seems like empirical, some sort of empirical data, right? How can that settle a moral issue, seems like, right? But, so, let me give you a, 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 an analogy. So, say that you are uh, out one night with your, uh, your friends and you're debating about some sort of, mor some issue, right? And you both have been, sort of, you've been drinking a lot of wine, right? Okay, so now, um, you know, and then you and your friend uh, disagree. And then at some point, your friend sort of said to you, and then you can't seem to like resolve the disagreement. Then your friend points out to you, hey, but you've been drinking, you just drank that whole bottle of wine. Now notice that that's an empirical claim, right? But it has the effect, it has a kind of, a, in philosophy, we call it a debunking effect. Right? It kind of undercuts whatever you've been saying that whole time, right? It's like, look, you've been drinking. But I've, I've, you just stated an empirical fact, uh, but somehow we think that, so there's a normative premise there, which is that you know, our decision uh, making, our thinking doesn't work as well when we're under the influence of alcohol, something like that, right? Uh, but just by stating that empirical argument, that's enough to say, hey, maybe um, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. Right? And so Green is trying to do something similar. He's trying to say, look, we thought you know, that we're all rational, we're all thinking, but in fact, when we look under the hood, sometimes we're confabulating, we're making up reasons. Uh, uh, and then in this case, we're just, we're, we're just making up stories to justify this emotional reaction that we have, this sort of irrational emotional reaction. And if we were just more rational, 
then we would, you know, if we were able to overcome this irrationality, then we would be, we would see that the truth of consequentialism. I'm not a consequentialist, I'm just reporting his argument. So, so what Green yeah. would <laughs> say basically is that any moral dialectic argument that I make is actually just fake news. Uh, yes, yes, that's right, that's right. Well, I, I don't know about any, but he wants to say in this case, in some cases, with respect to, especially uh, cases that have a lot of, there's something he calls the contact principle. So notice that when I give you the example of the, the, the big man on the bridge, you have to sort of push the person, right? And he sort of says, you know, that's sort of based on this evolutionary, uh, uh, past where you know w we really prohibit people from like clubbing each other, right? You know, hitting each other uh, with clubs. So this contact, right? And so we have this visceral reaction. And so he his explanation is that we're kind of responding to that, and that's why we think, oh no, we shouldn't do that, right? Uh, so so that might be an occasion to rethink the question, yeah. but it shouldn't have a. A, a decision factor, you know? In other words, I find the whole idea, well, you've been drinking, to be an ad hominem attack rather than, <laughs> rather than a content base. And I think the moral questions should rise and fall in deontological arguments. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you. And as you know from the book, I sort of, that's some of the things that I argue. I argue against Josh Green's uh, whole approach. But nevertheless, I mean, the debate between consequentialism and deontology have been going on for years, like over 100 years and maybe even longer. So we're not going to solve yeah. it here. Well, no, <laughs> so we're probably not going to solve it here. But so what Green, what's novel about Green's work was that he was sort of saying, look, maybe this is a way of moving forward the debate. And that part is very interesting. And um, we actually had uh, this uh, woman, Dr. Molly Crockett from Yale, sort of talking about sort of new, uh, uh, at my, my center, speaking at my center uh, on Friday, speaking about some of the follow-up studies about sort of harm. And uh, so there's a lot of, this is sort of an area of moral, sort of neuros, using neuroscience to look at moral judgments, one of the uh, more exciting areas uh, in academia today. So can I uh, suggest yeah. an analogy from the world of economics and finance yeah. and ask you to opine on it if you think it's okay. analogous to what neuroscience is doing? Because I can also make my ad hominem attacks, okay? <laughs> so there's a revolution in finance and economics that still has years to unfold. Whereas modern finance is built on the notion of the rational person operating prudently based on probabilities and expected outcomes, Come along Richard Thaler, who just got the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. Daniel Kahneman, who has a Nobel Prize, Amos Tversky, who died before he could get the, the Nobel Prize. They've all awakened us to the non-rational, not irrational, but the non-rational heuristics that frequently drive human behavior. And if I can give a, an example, investors are frequently more afraid of missing the big move than they are of incurring losses. And this, in part, explains the surge of Bitcoin. Right? So many individuals do not want to be forced to say they missed the big move, and so they pile into something at almost any price. The more expensive it becomes, the more likely they're missing the big bonanza. So we now have two Nobel laureates who've studied the effects of psychological predispositions in economic behavior. That's the role that I could envision as a rationalist mm -hmm. for neuroscience, mm -hmm. right? To uncover those predispositions mm -hmm but not to be given the deciding vote. Mm -hmm. How do you react to that? Yeah, so it turns out it's, it's so, you know, Thaler and uh, Cass Sunstein has, um, ha have the, this book called Nudge, um, and it's basically this idea that, so imagine you go into a cafeteria, uh, or you go into, you know, you go shopping. It turns out that they tend to put um, sort of uh, like sweeter stuff at the eye level of children, right? And so, uh, and it's, it's very smart because then, you know, you, you see, you, I have two kids and they're like, hey, daddy, can you buy this for me? You know, like sort of like you can't walk for, you know, 100 feet without sort of them asking another question. And so uh, basically it's a kind of nudge, it's a kind of subtle thing. And so they want to use that same idea to get people to be healthier. Right, for example. So this is sort of the liberal paternalism. So for example, in cafeterias, they wanted to, it's like not doing anything, they just want to put salads right at the beginning, 
right? So that people see the salad. So they want to put uh, the calories, right? So you've seen a lot of restaurants putting the calories, just getting people, you know, sort of subconsciously thinking about some of these, uh, these uh, important factors. And then as a result, they'll uh, hopefully make better, healthier, you know, lifestyles. And you can apply this in many other areas. Um, what I think about uh, this whole debate is, I actually think this is very rational. This is not, a, so they want to say, uh, so uh, Professor Kahneman and uh, Taylor, they, uh, they want to say that this is sort of irrational. My view is that it's actually shortcut reasoning. Heuristics are shortcut reasonings, right? But they're still reasoning uh, as opposed to something, they want to call this intuitions. I actually think that at least uh, philosophical uses of intuition is very, very different. So let me just briefly explain why I think it's a shortcut reasoning. So imagine that when I go to, um, you know, when I, um, when I go to a new city, right, and I'm trying to figure out which restaurants to go to, right, and I'm in a hotel, I'm staying in a new hotel, I've never been there. So often I go to the concierge and I sort of say, hey, can you recommend, you know, like a few restaurants. And then, uh, and then they'll say, hey, try that one, and I, I, I would take their advice, okay? So notice that that's a heuristic, okay? But it's a, a form of reasoning, and the reasoning goes something like this, you know? When you're in a foreign city, uh, the locals know better <laughs> than I would, right? And so in a lot of these nudging type cases, we're actually appealing to people's, you, were, you know, because decisions are complex, so we're trying to make it easier for them, right? So we're trying to shortcut, but it's still, um, I, I think it's still rational processes. So that's sort of, that, that's what I would say about uh, their cases. It doesn't undermine the, that these could be very effective, but there's a, but they want to tell the story that this is somehow an intuition, whereas I think intuitions belong to a different, it's a, it's a different way of knowing when we use intuition. So when I gave you the, um, the trolley cases before, I was asking you to make an intuitive judgment. So especially for those who haven't heard the case. So, you know, you're not sort of saying, uh, uh, Rabbi Glickman told me to, you know, that, you know, pushing the heavy person is bad, therefore it's bad. That would be a form of reasoning. You're sort of thinking for yourself and you're thinking, you know, no, I, I don't think I would do that, right? That's an intuitive judgment and that's very different, so. Okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm trying to uh, carve out yeah. a, a role for neuroscience mm -hmm. in, in a moral philosophy discussion. Mm -hmm. where, where do, what's left for it to do? If, does it just unveil my predispositions and my prejudices? Is that, is, that, is that what its benefits for? So that I can re-examine them? Or does it actually get a vote in the decision-making process? I think the, uh, I think the way I was suggesting in terms of the debunking is exactly that. It kind of reveals, so it turns out, so we, th you know, back in this sort of Kantian tradition, we think we're sort of all always rational um, but it turns out that just a lot of social psychology have shown that we make a lot of, we're on autopilot most of the time, right? It's because it's very expensive uh, for our brain, like so it takes, uh, takes a lot of energy to be thinking about every decision, like sort of calculating every decision every time, right? So we are, we're sort of on autopilot most of the time. And that's really interesting because, but what that doesn't settle. So some people want to draw the conclusion, oh, that sh therefore shows that we're not rational at all. And so I think that conclusion is a bit too hasty because it could be based on prior reasoning, right? It could have been that, look, you figured it out. I figured out how to get into my subway, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now I can be on autopilot. I know exactly where to go. I don't have to think about it, right? But the first time I did it, I had to get out the map and, you know, really figure out how to get there, et cetera, et cetera. But once you, you know, um, and so I think it's too quick just to look at the uh, uh, neuroscience data and conclude that these are all irrational processes. They could be, be based on prior reasoning processes. You know, I'm, I'm a man of a certain age and I grew up reading 1984 and Aldous mm -hmm. Huxley. Yeah. It seems to me that a lot of the, you know, you mentioned the beginning, Alexa and whatever, mm -hmm. reminded me of Big Brother in Winston Smith's home. You, uh, you talk about the, uh, you know, bioengineering and it reminds me of Brave New World. Yeah. Um, so many of these things that were anticipated and whatever, I think we could do better to temper science a little bit with literature. How do you relate to that? Oh, I, I think that's right. In fact, I think the literature have been uh, the, like, sort of, um, 
they've been forecasting many of these issues for years, and it's now the science is kind of catching up and kind of making it possible. So, you know, before the internet, people, I mean, there was, um, uh, the Wire Society was published in 1977, right? And so, which basically sort of predicted the internet, you know, the, you know, sort of 1977, the book said that, you know, in about 25 years time, it's actually pretty accurate, that makes it about 2002, you know, sort of uh, 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 three, uh, sort of, it said that, you know, in about 25 years, um, Every home will have a monitor. You'll be able to check baseball, sort of like, you know, read about sort of uh, baseball scores, you know, like, and, and, and check your stocks, et cetera, et cetera. It's basically the internet that we have today. And so uh, it, it's, it, I think uh, in philosophy, there's something called reflective equilibrium where we kind of go back and forth. We take some of these literary ideas and people are actually trying to, let's say, and then other people, the engineers are saying, hey, can we make that happen? Let's try to make it happen. And so they're building things based on some of these ideas. So I'd like to give you a little gift from Yeshiva University. Yeah. Uh, we have a, 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 a method for reaching reflective equilibrium. <laughs> We have one day a week when we turn off the internet, our smartphones, uh -huh. and connection to the outside world. And more than that, we preserve that. It preserved us. Uh -huh. you know, so I think it's a, the, uh, you, you give a good uh, um, background for it. Um, how much are we getting to the? OK, did you want to show one of your? Yes, let's, uh, I wanted to give you much. So <laughs> while, while you're setting that up, I do want to mention that um, in the, Rabbi Tendler has his own version of nudge. So I remember that he used to, whenever I'd run into him, he'd say to me, you know, you really have to take care of yourself. You have to lose weight, you have to exercise, and whatever. So finally, when I lost weight, I saw him, and I said, Rebbe, look, I lost some weight. And his answer was, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> Except for that one weird species of jellyfish that can pop back and forth between larval and adult states, all living things are built to die. So as unpleasant as it is, it's only logical to expect that someday you will also, uh, let's put this delicately, uh, stop being alive. Now I'm gonna be honest, I personally believe that a dramatically expanded lifespan would be awesome, but it's always been a long way off. And it's probably a longer way off than any of our lives will be. But there is this vague idea that in the distant future, humanity might figure out a way to cheat death. So nobody's getting their hopes up, but some researchers are trying to close the gap by figuring out how to map the human brain and simulate it on a computer. Essentially, in the long term, they want to figure out how to upload the human mind. Now, the idea of mind uploading has been floating around science fiction for decades, but it's only recently that it started to look like actually maybe a little bit in the distant future possible. In theory, all you'd have to do is program a map of your brain onto a computer, and once things are all set up, you just run the program and voila, an uploaded working brain. The question, of course, is how to actually do that because, like, brains are very complicated. The average human brain contains 86 billion neurons, and each of those neurons can form thousands of connections with each other. We're talking hundreds of trillions of synapses, or pathways that exchange information. So if you want to build a brain, the first thing you're going to need is a map. Wow. <laughs> So um, let me just, uh, I, I think it's helpful to uh, step back and think about why we might want to do that, right? So one reason why, why we want, might want to do that is sort of in terms of just being able to live longer, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a more immediate reason that some people are talking about now. So you might have read this week that uh, AlphaGo Zero is sort of this, uh, so AlphaGo, it was a program that was, uh, uh, developed by Google DeepMind about a year ago, and it beat the world's uh, number one, uh, the Go player. It's, Go is a, sort of a game from the east, and it's sort of, you have black stones and white stones, and it, it's sort of very hard to calculate um, sort of the moves, but it beat the world's best Go player um, last year. And then AlphaGo Zero was created a couple months ago, where um, this machine, uh, they basically gave it something called, uh, conv it's called convolution that it's re uh, self-reinforcement learning. It just taught itself. So, so in the old, way, uh, old days, people used to uh, 
so AlphaGo Zero, uh, AlphaGo was uh, trained by uploading a bunch of human games, and it learned from the human games, and then it then you know was able to beat the the, hum the best human player. The AlphaGo Zero was given no human games whatsoever. It just played against itself uh, uh, four million times, and then after that, it played uh, the AlphaGo Zero played against AlphaGo, um, and. Can you guess, like, like uh, so they played 100 games. What do you guys, what, what, do you, what do you think the outcome was? It was 100 to zero. The alpha self-learning sort of uh, basically beat the one that was sort of human trained. Now, they took that same technology um, and they applied it to chess. Because they thought, you know, chess is going to be more complicated. Because like in the Go, it's just black and white, and they're just putting down the stones. But chess, they're actually different moves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they used the same idea, and they trained a chess program in four hours. And the, that program then played against the world's best chess program right now. It's called Stockfish, right? And it beat that. It, basically wiped the, <laughs> you know, they played 100 games, it won, like, when it played white, it won most of the games, and then when it played black, it played to, to a draw. Um, but, um, so that's where we're at in terms of artificial intelligence. And so a lot of people are worried that with uh, the only way that you're gonna be able to handle, like, they're, they're just getting smart, the machines are coming, and they're getting smarter, and how are you gonna survive that? The only way for us to survive that is for us to get smarter. And one of the ways of getting smarter is this, right? How can we augment our intelligence? How can we improve our intelligence? So a lot of neuroscience, a lot of the work that the US government, DARPA, the Defense Advanced uh, Pro uh, uh, Project Agency, uh, they've been sort of looking at ways of enhancing our intelligence, uh, like sort of in terms of improving memory, in terms of improving alertness, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so, you know, in this context, uh, a lot of, you know, Elon Musk is sort of talking about neural links and how we need to be sort of engaged in these, sort of basically we need to go from biological intelligence to digital intelligence. Okay, so one philosophical issues, uh, issue that comes up is whether the uploaded, if, you were, if your mind were uploaded, is that gonna be you, right? And this is a question of identity. And my view is that it won't be you. Right? Not, so in philosophy, we distinguish between what's called numerical identity and narrative identity. So the qualitatively, um, the, the individual that's uploaded might have all your personalities, characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you can survive the upload. And here's a sort of a quick way to see why, right? Um, what, once it's uploaded, presumably you can make copies, right? And so imagine that you make 100 copies, right? So you can, uh, and you wrote a whole uh, paper about identity and defending identity. You can only be identical to yourself. A can only be identical to A, right? They have to have the same exact properties. So that means that you cannot be identical to all those hundreds of copies, right, of you. They're not you. Right, so, um, so I think that that's gonna be a problem, but I think uh, there's a different way by which we can maybe survive, and that's something, uh, so a lot of people now are exploring something called gradual replacement. So the gradual replacement works as follows. You take each neuron and you replace it with something that's kind of inorganic, right? And then through that gradual process, there, that might, you know, at the end of it, the whole brain becomes inorganic, right? And then there's a question about whether you can sort of, whether that'll be you at the end of it. I think there's an argument to be made that that could be you, but I think the uploading doesn't work. Can I, you know, yeah. I, here's yeah. a response from me. Yeah. Um, if yeah. we had a spreadsheet that was large enough or a tree that was large enough, you could take all the moves in chess or go or whatever, yeah. and you could die a lot, you could actually diagram them, you know what they are. But life isn't that way. Life right. has so many things yeah. that are not diagrammed. And I'll yeah. say, I'll just give the example that the rabbi said that a, uh, uh, a Roman matron once asked one of the rabbis, what is God doing since uh, creation was over? Mm -hmm. And they answered that he's putting men and women together. He's making matches between them. <laughs> Who can predict? when a match takes. Mm. 
who can predict? It's not a, uh, so I would say the most wonderful things about life are not digital. That would be my response. Yeah, no, the, I, and, and I think there's a, I, I'd be very sympathetic, you know, I think there, that, that, that sounds right to me, so. <laughs> So. Well, thanks very much for uh, being here today. And this yeah. is the beginning. We're going to have a great friendship. So it's the beginning. Yeah, great. Very good yeah. friendship. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, I could go on. <laughs> There's so, so much to talk about. Thank you to Rabbi Glickman and Dr. Liao. We have yeah. time for one question. So I'm going to take over here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So. Isn't consequentialism another way of saying the ends justify the means? Yes. The Nazis did that and didn't work out well. That's right. <laughs> um, it seems to me that the, that the person who made the assertion that the uh, consequential reasoning was better, if you will, since based on the functional MRI, had his own hidden uh, assertions underneath it. Because he's assuming that the amygdala is inherently more primitive mm. than the prefrontal. Now, mm. if you, I'll just take a simple example. If you're religious and you, believe, and you don't accept the, the, certainly the, the, his approach to, to evolution, and you say the amygdala is, is equal to the prefrontal, mm or perhaps better because mm. people as emotions, that's what differentiates them yeah. from robots, yeah. you could make the entirely opposite assertion mm -hmm. that no, that the deontological the, is, is actually a better response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's right. So part of his argument, his argument's uh, very controversial, and part of it depends on this evolutionary just-so story. So he wants to say that, you know, the amygdala, you can actually find that in, hu that not just in humans, but in other animals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, and, but the prefrontal, uh, prefrontal cortex, you can only find that in humans, or sort of like, you know, it being that big. And so, uh, on the basis of that, you know, it sort of, it, it developed evolutionarily, like, much later, and he wants to say, therefore, that makes it more rational. I mean, this is a simple, I, I'm kind of simplifying his view a bit, uh, but that's sort of one of the arguments that he makes. So. Can we conclude, by the way, with a, the people that make this really possible, the wonderful students of Yeshiva University? <laughs> this opportunity to thank you for coming out in support of the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society. As this is my fourth year and final year on the Medical Ethics Society, I have seen in the preceding years the impact that the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society has assumed on both the Yeshiva University student body and the greater Jewish community at large. Genetically screening more than 1,200 students, a yearly moot bay dean debate at Cardozo Law School, an annual 300-person conference, these are all events that relay only a small glimpse into the major impact that the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society has achieved. To me, the Yeshiva University Student Medical Ethics Society is a clear example of Torah Umada, allowing us to combine the intricacies and importance of science and medicine in congruence with Torah and Jewish values. Um, some of my most uh, cherished memories here at Yeshiva University have come from the Medical Ethics Society. I joined the society as a, as a board member where I was given the opportunity to share my passion for science and philosophy uh, with my fellow students. Um, and this opportunity was not only a tremendous learning experience for me, um, teaching me what it takes to collaborate with a team and bring a vision to life, um, but also was a highlight of my communal experience at YU. Uh, whether it was a transhumanist roundtable, a superbug pl plenary, or a scientific objectivity workshop, I have continually enjoyed working with the professional and motivated Medical Ethics Society board. Uh, the Medical Ethics Society has given me a family of friends to join in bringing some of the most important topics, speakers, and conversations um, around ethics and medicine to the student body. Uh, we are so grateful um, to the many individuals that made this conference possible. Uh, first, we'd like to thank our, our speakers today, President Berman, Rabbi Moshe Tendler, Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman, Dr. Anna Cuervo, Dr. Edward Burns, Rabbi J. David Blech, Dr. Neville Sanjana, Dr. Matthew Liao, and Rabbi Ozer Glickman. It was such a privilege to hear from all of you. Uh, we would also like to thank 
uh, Rabbi Jakob Glasser, Menachem Lewin, Rabbi Rob Shore, and Rabbi Arya Charka from the Center of the Jewish Future. Their continuous support has made this possible. Uh, we'd also like to have a special thanks to our society mentor, Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman, for his guidance and advice. Rabbi Reichman has been answering our emails and calls at all hours of the day and has been a role model for the entire society. And finally, we would like to thank uh, President Berman, Paul Glasser, and the Community Synagogue of Muncie for their support of the society. This event um, has, would not be possible without them. And just... <laughs> we would like to thank our incredible Medical Ethics Society board, especially Kalman Laffer and Yael Mayer from our executive board for working tirelessly throughout their free time to make this conference come to life. We are so incredibly privileged to work with an amazing and motivated students and future leaders. <laughs> and most importantly, as presidents of our last conference, we would like to thank each and every one of you for coming out today and participating in the 11th annual Fold Family Conference.